<clears throat> about to, uh, well, one, the... Uh, we are alive. We are alive. Okay. So I have got my red thyme and my red clover on order now. It's coming in the mail. Oh, to plant? Yeah. Take care of my backyard. Ground, for possibly. ground cover? Okay. Yeah. Uh, for is the cover, Is the thyme for, the, the, one, the, the blooming thing? Yeah. For mosquitoes yeah. and whatnot? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. Uh, so does the clover, though. They both, they're both they both similar in that sense that they... I know, but everybody pulls clothes. the clover, and you're like, one, it's a great it's it's a great ground cover. I mean... 100%. It's yeah. pretty hard to kill it. Very difficult to kill. I have Creeping Charlie in my front yard, which uh -huh. is beautiful. I love it. It doesn't matter what you do. It comes back. And no, the whole point is, like, I um, even with the logs and stuff that I cut up and, and left on the edge of the property to create, again, that that uh, ecosystem, start moving that ecosystem in that direction of mushrooms and bugs and rodents yeah, and stuff. Yeah. Is, you mean you're going to have soil again? Right, exactly. Is creating, because we're buying the house, we're buying the property. And so that whole two and a half acres, as far as we're concerned, we have the maple tree already in. It'll be ready to mm -hmm. give us syrup in like a year from now. Well, we got two pear trees coming in because apparently you have to plant two at a time because they pollinate each other. And so you have to have two pear trees to produce fruit. Which technically makes sense when you think about it. <laughs> it's like, it's like you know nothing of fruit trees, <laughs> right? And and then we got our apple trees coming in as well, and we've got our four elderberry trees. They're omnisexual, androgynous trees, right? Yes. How dare you, like root them in place and force them to be mates forever? <laughs> and um, trees need to be set free. Maybe we could we should start a peta like movement, but for vegetation. Where we just run Set around the trees uprooting. Free. <clears throat> we just run around uprooting things and throwing them up in the air. I don't know about you. I mean, we we've got a couple of people, you know, in the, within a few blocks of our house where they mm -hmm. where they just have like the wildflower, you know, front yard, you know, yeah. just the wild grass and whatever. It's beautiful. And you know, the village hates them. And I of just course. look at it. and It's like, oh, it's such right. a joy. It's such a joy. I mean, you look at it. It's like these people are interesting. By the way, if you want to talk about brainwashing, here's one for you. Do this on Sunday. Green grass. Start telling. <laughs> no, tell people that the dandelion is a part of the sunflower family and not a weed. It's a fact. The dandelion is a part of the sunflower family. It's not a weed. But it got labeled a weed. And you know who labeled it a weed? Uh, I did Monsanto? The, I, did the, I don't know. <laughs> Roundup. Roundup. Okay. Yeah. They did it to sell their product. They completely made it up. It's not even based in any scientific fact. That's why I'm like, because well, now, cause now like, you no, can't even use the dandelions the way you used to, like to make dandelion wine or whatever. Well, because you can it's in a, my house. Well, I mean, it depends on if your neighbors are spraying for dandelions, though. Right. They're no. Going to get whatever toxins no. are. Yeah. We live in Webster. There's no spraying for weeds around here. <laughs> but no, we just realized, like, you know, rather than have hives, we're going to create an ecosystem that attracts bees, and. Same thing, once the bees come back and the birds come back and everything starts coming back and you create this ecosystem <clears throat> and we're edged on two sides by our crick. So we have bullfrogs, we have toads, we have all that stuff too, um, along with the mosquitoes. It just creates an overall ecosystem that's sustainable. And then you're constantly creating what you need. You need the pollen and you need the bees and you need the birds and you need the bugs and you need the rodents. You need all of that interaction, right? To create a healthy ecosystem. And you look around and you realize that obviously farming is completely backwards and upside down from the way that it's intended to be done. Right. That's why I meant, made the comment about soil versus yeah. dirt. I mean, they have right. dirt farms. They're just dirt right. and you have to, all the mm -hmm. nutrients you have to add chemically. Right. Or, versus, or yeah. spread or whatever. Yeah. Versus you just create compost bins, a lot of them and large ones. Well, and who, big, depending I on how don't know. I was listening to something where they were talking about how Growing up, they remember uh, after harvest they would just they would just burn burn whatever was left in the field. They right. didn't they didn't take all the chaff off. They just burned mm -hmm. it. Yeah, which doesn't destroy the minerals. Correct. Right. So so then you just all the mineral content remains mm -hmm. that's left Correct. from the yeah. yeah. Well, all the other minerals true the trace metals and yeah, trace you just turn it over. Yeah. Oh, don't restart! Don't restart my computer. <laughs> Software update. Good morning, Melody. Yes, the creeping Charlie is amazing for allergies. See, there you go. So we, the stuff we that the... we're told to kill. Is actually the stuff that's beneficial to us. And I can't remember what this the stuff world. was, but for out, like when you get a, a sting or a bite, mm -hmm. and it was it's like a broadleaf weed. Yeah, they call it yeah. weed, but I can't remember what it is. And you just like you just like, it's almost like aloe when you when you mm -hmm. crunch it up and you just yeah. spread it on the, mm -hmm. and they're like it's done. Or if you get a scrape or something, we right. do that with the kids. We taught them to do it. They just go like you know, yeah. They just go and rub that right. stuff on there, and then they were good mm -hmm. to go. And it was yeah. just a weed in our backyard. I don't know what it was. Plantain, mm -hmm. there it is. 
Nobody knows. Yeah, plantain. There you go. Mm-hmm. I always think of the of the thing that looks like a banana, but mm-hmm. which is great when it's caramelized. I love caramelized plantains. It's the best. I imagine. But lots uh, of sugar. Oh, so much sugar. It's delightful. <laughs> um, or if you're into Cuban plantains, they add rum and they caramelize it with rum and then it's extra special good. Extra, extra special sugar. Good. Yeah. Extra alcoholic sugar. But it's just amazing <laughs> to me how far removed we are from creation mm-hmm. as creatures ourselves. And hopefully I see more and more people because there's people that I've been introducing to different pages and websites and so forth so that they can start this themselves. And like Melody pointed out, it's like, as you start to learn these things and you go down these, these rabbit holes, you learn so much that you've been taught the opposite your whole life, that then when you rediscover these things, it's just, again, the light goes off and then you start talking to people. <clears throat> like I've got people that want to spray for my dandelions and I'm like, no, don't touch my dandelions. Well, they're a weed. No, they're not. They're not a weed. They're very useful. They're helpful. Your neighbor who doesn't want dandelions will think that you're a terrible person. But right, oh well. Yeah, exactly. Again, I live in Webster. <laughs> they are Standard, <laughs> standards and practices here are pretty low as far as that goes. My neighbor actually burns his garbage in his front lawn. So, well, so here's what I think it is. I, you know, like we were talking about before we went live, we were talking mm-hmm. about, um, you know, how people are kind of wonderfully diverse until they mm-hmm. get processed through the system right. and they come out. You know, just extruded compulsory you know, education. They're, they're that. They're the pink. Uh, the the pink slime of, mm-hmm. uh, you know, of people. Chicken nuggets. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as long as you bread it, it tastes okay, right? Mm, right. No, that's ammonia. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, so it's the same thing with with uh, environmental stuff. Is that mm-hmm. um, the reason why we moved to like? I guess I would suggest <clears throat> the reason we moved to like highly processed and uh, very World territorial. War II, by the way, it was World War Two. Right, but it's predictability and consistency. Mm-hmm. Um, there's nothing that exactly. we that I, frightens us more. I would say, just as a people, mm-hmm. is to have oh have an outbreak of dandelions, right? Because mm-hmm. now you, you learn that you're really not in control of the the world that you live in. Correct. Right. I mean, we would say your caretakers are stewards, but then mm-hmm. like one one field can have dandelions, and then mm-hmm. the next neighbor might have you know your your red uh, whatever you called it red thyme, red clover, yeah. creeping yeah. Charlie, yeah. Right, and that that there can be a diversity, and not everybody everybody's yard has to look the same, right. and you can have diff- different trees, and I mean right. this, and if you just let things go, mm-hmm. they'll they'll go there anyway. Correct. Whatever is suitable right. for your soil composition, for mm-hmm. example, that's what's going to end up growing there because it's right. going to thrive. Mm-hmm. And you're like, well, I don't like thistles. Well, I'm sorry, yeah. that's what that's, that's what, what you your got. ground is built so for. So now make thistle wine or thistle tea. Yeah, work with it. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I'm, I live on what was for about a hundred years, cattle pasturage. So the soil here that I, li- the soil that's, uh, that makes up my backyard and my front yard is so rich in nutrients from a yeah. century of cows doing their business that I'll, I walk off my back deck in the spring with a bag of sunflower seeds. I just throw them in the air and they all grow. No matter where they land, they just grow. It drives my wife right. nuts. I was listening to it. <laughs> I was listening to, you know, Chris Martinson. Hmm. Uh, Peak Prosperity is his podcast. The, the okay. Eric Weinstein <clears throat> turned me on to this guy. He's interesting. Um, but he's he's homesteading. Okay. He's been doing it for 15 years or something. Yeah. And, and then Peak Prosperity is like his monetizing of it. <laughs> he's got a website and whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, but he was talking about this, that they've got like their orchard. Yeah. And, and they just let the cows work in the orchard. Yeah. So they graze amongst, and then they, they like end up breaking yeah, up the soil. they all over it, yeah. It, yeah, they yep. all those nutrient, all those minerals, everything that they right. release, just mm-hmm. on the ground, all over right. the place. Things mm-hmm. grow, but they don't. Mm-hmm. They don't also weed around their orchard, hmm. and so then you end up with I don't remember what plants, but you know various things that actually make it more pleasant to work in the orchard. Right, because you don't just have this like, right, you know, the terroir, right? Isn't that the, mm-hmm. the French word? Yeah, you know, I imagine it affects the the flavor of the fruit too. Right, you know, and we and we just we've lost that. We've lost I, that. But we t- didn't we talk about this in the last episode? I feel like mm. we did, or maybe when we had that, we were doing Paulson on Genesis, and mm-hmm. that uh, most coffee is not in, on cultivated soil right. or dirt. Yeah, they don't use pesticides or herbicides. Mm-hmm. They just, it's grown in a it's not a monoculture. Mm-hmm. They they mm-hmm. grow it in a uh, like in a permaculture kind of right. environment, mm-hmm. and uh, you know they even will take the the pulp and just go mm-hmm. and spread it you know, right. back into the soil. Yeah. No, yeah. I told you when I was in Guatemala, I was there the entirety of the harvest. And so I got to see everything from, you know, 
snout to hoof, so to speak, right. from not only them cutting the plant, but also how they processed it and what they did with the pulp. And they pay the kids from the village to gi- dig these giant pits. Yeah. And then they pull the pulp yeah. in, they cover it, and they leave it there, fallow. Oh, to, to, to ferment it. Yeah. yeah. And nothing's wasted. The no, whole but process. I, but I, I mean, there are, I'm sure there's people who are trying to figure out ways to, to, to domesticate, in a sense, coffee, make it very, you know. Right. <clears throat> I mean, I know the Kenyans do, but, um, but I mean, it makes, what the problem that people have with it is it's just, it's very expensive and it's labor intensive. Yeah. I'm like, well, what's wrong with that? It's like, we don't, we can't actually like rejoice in the labor of these farmers. Well, but yeah. it's so physical. So what? Right. Like you want them to sit at a desk or to, to be coding or something. Yes. Why can't we have people that enjoy right. cultivating, you know, a, a coffee crop, you know, in the wild? Why, why is this a problem? And we just pay for it. Right. And if the problem is that they're not making a living wage, then pay them a living wage. We'll, mm-hmm. you know, oh, but then the coffee will be twenty dollars a bag instead of seventeen. Right. So what? Well, I know uh, a story from a couple of years back. I may be incorrect on this, so don't skewer me in the comments. But ibogaine, the, the ibogaine, it grows in Africa naturally, mm, okay. and so these pharmaceutical companies attempted to synthesize it, and they can't. They just can't synthesize the chemical compounds that make ibogaine effective as a psychoactive drug that they use in the treatment of trauma and, and so forth. Mm, mm-hmm. But they, you know, they're still trying to do that because it takes so long for ibogaine, I think it's a tree, to grow and then you have to harvest the root, I think it is. And once you harvest the root, obviously, if, you, if you're trying to do this for mass production, you're going to end up killing trees. And so these pharmaceutical companies who are trying to profit off of this plant they can't in fact yeah they use ibogaine to counter drug addiction actually yeah i mean at best they might be able to mimic it yeah it's the root bark of the iboga tree from which the ibogaine is extracted it was discovered by the pygmy tribe of central africa who passed the knowledge on to buiti tribe of gabon french explorers then learned about it in the 1890s and 1900s and then again, yeah, they took it back to France with them, of course, gave it a fancy name and tried to sell it. <laughs> Additionally, the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency studied the effects of Ibogaine in the 1950s. Are you going to tell me it's MK Ultra? Yeah, it was actually a part of MK Ultra. They were actually giving people <laughs> Ibogaine. How did I know you them. were going to get there? <laughs> well, it's true. I mean, even, you know, it's documented. They're like, yeah, we did that in the 50s. We don't do that anymore. Uh-huh. Now we have social yeah, right. media. We don't have to. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. You so yeah, as Josh says, we are societally allergic to inefficiency. Well, again, right, well, I, I always use the same example. When God says that I have created the ordering of the heavens and the earth, right? And you look at a forest. To our eyes, a forest is nothing but chaos. <laughs> and God's like, this is how I can create order. And so then when we plant trees, tree farms are straight rows, everyone equally spaced for miles. Well, right? but, but I don't think it's just inefficiency, although we are to that. We don't like people to like, wait, you, you know, I think inefficiency that, is loss of control. That, so what I was going to say is that we're allergic yeah. to inconsistency. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We'd rather, I mean, obviously this was trained by fast food, I think in part. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and well, like you said, post-World War II, all the box foods yeah. and, you know, spam. I mean, it's consistent. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. It's always disgusting. So, you know. Well, Sorry, Annie brought this up. People. My wife brought this up a couple of weeks ago that McDonald's claims that no matter where you go in the world, if you order a hamburger from that restaurant, it will taste the exact same as the hamburger from the restaurant in your hometown. You have to wonder what kind of magic they have to do to make it. And that that's happen. what Annie said. She's like, what kind of chemicals do you have to put in the food to guarantee that if you're in Shanghai and you order a McDonald's, it's going to taste the exact same as the McDonald's in Minneapolis? Right. Well, and I just, I use the parallel. I mean, I have blended coffee, which mm-hmm. tries to, oh, work out any inconsistencies right right <laughs> and then i have the the single origins which are mm-hmm. and they're not even consistent year to year right you know from the same farm right and for me that's those are the delightful ones those are the ones mm-hmm. that are enjoyable and like i'm never going to have this coffee experience again Correct. and that's okay oh, dude trust me i had that peruvian yesterday that that's you sent. What, yeah annie was saying and he texted you <laughs> i've been out of it for a couple of weeks so that's yeah. the problem though is when you drink it you realize oh i can't have this back it's the is a moment it is but, but that's, that's okay. the point. We yeah. no, but that's the point is we hate that. Like you said, it's that lack of consistency that drives us crazy. Which is ironic, of course, because then when we finally get consistency, such as like the historic liturgy, 
and the weekly mm-hmm. sacrament, then you complain about the consistency of it. Well, but like, I mean, I drove by um, um, somebody who had asparagus out, right? Because it's in season. Yeah. And it's like that asparagus tastes totally different. Right. <laughs> like, and it wouldn't, um, oh, we were in Germany when it was the, what was it? It was the white asparagus season. So mm. they have white asparagus. I don't yeah. know, some breed. Mm. Um, and in Germany, you like every restaurant, everybody's got having white asparagus for like right. two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> because that's when you get it. Right. You and you don't get it. it. And, and they don't, and, yeah. and they don't like, ship it in from mexico obviously right. it's europe right they don't try to grow it somewhere else whatever mm-hmm. it's like this is white asparagus season and every dish we're yeah. having asparagus with everything and we love it and then then we're done right until next year mm-hmm. and, and there's so, so there's some kind of joy about that not mm-hmm. being able to have infinite access to everything all the time right you know it's actually having some restriction <laughs> huh weird i know yeah almost like you the know. law is given to restrain us <laughs> well even something like tomatoes or whatever yeah. and then we just force it i mean i've talked about this with light mm-hmm. it's like why why do we not sleep more in the winter than we do in the summer correct because that's actually the pattern that right that's what you're supposed to do it's what we see mm-hmm. it's like you know hibernation and it's okay you can work less right. in the winter it's okay mm-hmm. and then you'll be you'll be rested and ready mm-hmm. to go when the summer comes right i don't know yeah, we're just trying. Everybody's it's that round round peg in a square hole. Just it is. like, and then maybe that's that's where it gets to be. <coughs> uh, I don't know. Maybe it's not too strong to say demonic when you're just mm-hmm. trying to force creation to to bend to your will oh, yeah. rather than just steward what you're given. Well, we worship the sun by it's creating false suns. Yeah, I mean that's what the clock is based on and the calendar and everything else. And so instead yeah. of sleeping when it's dark and waking up when it's light. No, the clock says it's. Are we going to talk about daylight savings time now? We could, and it's being an abomination. It's cool. Of course, it is. It's just absurd. Well, it's a way. Actually, daylight savings is not the abomination. (laughs) The fixed, the fixed clock is. Yeah. And daylight savings actually is an attempt to try to correct what should happen naturally. Like you get up in the morning. It's got to add that thirteenth month, and then we'll level everything off. Twenty-eight days, thirteen months. Twenty-seven, twenty-eight days, and thirteen months. Perfect. Turtles all the way down, baby. 13. I know. It's a conspiracy. Oh. Should we actually record a show? Let's record a show. I'm going to hit record right and recording. Me too. Uh, pausing Dropbox because I'm at church and otherwise this is going to not go well. Indefinitely. All right. Good. And then we do uh, bump. War champ. There we go. So quiet. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. This is the Band Book Podcast, episode number 252. And we are your hosts, Christopher Gillespie. I'm going to have to make it a little quieter so you can hear me. <laughs> <laughs> Chilling and willing, maxing and relaxing. And I am Donovan Riley. Welcome back to the show, as I said. Thank you to 1517 for allowing us to have this platform to discuss theology and pastoral matters with you. There's and more to be th- said there, isn't there? Did you? I, uh, I got the email. That's your. You job. got the email. I don't actually have the audio. There's supposed to be a promo that I'm supposed to play here, but I don't have the promo because it's linked to an email address that doesn't have access to a Google Doc and so whatever. I can't get it. But we could talk about it a little bit. <laughs> Producer, produce, go. Well, I no. I asked for requ- I requested access to the document, but I mm-hmm. haven't gotten it. Well, anyway, we are now in uh, the anniversary of the 1517 Podcast Network. There the fourth go. anniversary, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I guess we were we were at the launch, weren't we? We were, yes. So that means it's our fourth anniversary too. I guess of so, this yeah. show. Oh, okay. So uh, where apologies. Do you go? Where, do you... And, uh... <laughs> <laughs> where do you go for the fifteen seventeen podcast network? The fifteen seventeen dot org slash podcast. Wow, that's really go. hard to find, isn't it? Yep. Uh, all sorts of different stuff. We listen to a few. Uh, we like the Stephen Paulson one. Outlaw, Outlaw God. God. Yep. Yeah. Um, I've listened pretty much to the entire 40 minutes in the Old Testament one. That's Chad mm-hmm. Bird and Dan Price. Um, 30 minutes, right? That's another one. Mm-hmm. We've got stuff on confessions. There's a preaching one. I don't remember what these are all called. Right. I think I think there's ones for ladies too. So the ladies get their I shows. Think so Cindy Koch did one. I don't know if it's a limited series or not, but Cindy's got one. Kate, our friend Kate mm-hmm. does a podcast. Yeah. 
There was the, and then there's the shorter uh, form ones that have like seasons mm -hmm. that come and go. Uh, we Debbie has Christianity hers. by Deb. Yep. yep. Yeah, that's the one I was thinking there's of. There's something for everybody. All right, so here's I the deal. So why are we supposed to bring this up? Because <laughs> it's time for a fundraiser, of course. Right. 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 Uh, Which our listeners money. have been doing yes, all of along course. because we've been right. telling them to not only send their donations, but also include their praise and thanksgiving for the podcast and how much they enjoy our conversation. But anyway, if you if you go and you sign up for a reoccurring gift this week, 100% of that goes back into the show. Right. Not so to us, but to the show. To the shows, yes. 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 But to podcasts. So right. uh, what is that? It's 1517.org slash ba or backslash celebrate. That's where you go for it this week. Mm-hmm. Um, and go and do the do the regular gift, and then make sure you put in there that Band Books is the best show on the network. Yes, hundred um, percent. It actually course. helps. As funny as it might sound, it actually does help us. So yeah. that fifteen seventy knows that not only do people listen, but they actually enjoy the show. Well, and and what in particular are they benefiting from? Right, because right. then fifteen seventeen reinvests in us. Sunday with his family. Oh, really? Yeah. So okay. that was, that was Good. again. I, I inadvertently, without even thinking, when people are like, "Yeah, I listen to the show," I just say condolences. I don't even. <laughs> <laughs> I had somebody come up to me. Uh, I was at the commencement at uh, mm -hmm. Concordia University, Nebraska, right? So I was not in my comfort zone mm -hmm. uh, for any number of reasons. <laughs> I was around anyway, people. I was around other people. Well, right. And then I, uh, we had a listener come up to me and it was like, I listen to your show. And I'm like, do you really? <laughs> I'm like, you and you like sought me out do i brace for the slap or for the hug which was which is kind well of... then he called me dr heisenberg and i'm like do you drink my coffee there we he's go he's like oh i'd like to and so then i sold him some coffee too there so. we go now we know now <laughs> cross we marketing is, is key yes. right yeah but it is helpful um mm -hmm. and it's encouraging it right so yeah, that well, we... we do the show for you i was talking with our friend ed yesterday about that yeah. and he asked about what kind of feedback we get because like any institution or group, you don't get a lot of feedback unless you make a mistake or you screw up and you get called a principal. <laughs> it's just the nature of the institution. It's so true. So true. And so if you as the listener don't get, provide us with feedback, we kind of fly blind because like anybody, you get locked into a conversation and you think you're going the right way. You think that what you're doing is beneficial and useful because it is to you. It's like we've talked about when you write a sermon as a pastor, the first person you're writing it to is yourself. And that's why then... Unless you're dishonest. Unless you're dishonest with yourself. But then you're being dishonest in public with your congregation. With your with hearers others. too, right. yes. <clears throat> and so there are Sundays I get up in the pulpit and I preach what I'm given to preach. And people will come up to me afterwards and say, uh, you know, thanks, but not your best. And I encourage that in my congregation. I want people to hold me accountable and say, listen, man, you obviously had a rough week. Like last Sunday, actually, this happened after the fact. My council president texted me and said, hey, I could tell that you were struggling with a lot of stuff today, but the teaching and the preaching was spot on. Thank you. Hmm. And I didn't even realize that that was, you know, out there for people to see, but apparently it was. And it's the same thing hmm. with the show. We went through two years where we were fighting our battles as pastors and as fathers and husbands and within our communities. And... We with were, the overreach of the totalitarian state, you mean? With the overreach of the state. And <laughs> I was involved in a lawsuit with the state. I was writing religious exemptions. Everything was a constant right, battle. Right, right. And so we were having the conversation with Dreyer and the Christian Dissonance book. And a lot of people benefited from that. But then we got stuck in it and we couldn't really break free of it because we had this conversation that had been ongoing. <clears throat> and then once we came back to Paulson and, and his critique of Origin of Species and the Hidden God, I recognized after the fact about how uninvigorated I had become by different conversations, not just this one, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me. And then reading Paulson again, reinvigorated me and got me excited again. And so without that reader and that listener feedback, it's easy for us to also forget or not really forget, just we don't know who's listening and we don't right, know but, what you're listening I mean, to. What are, I, I guess in hindsight now, when you look at uh, what happened with the Dreher book, is that we ended up becoming sheep of a sort ourselves. The sure. very thing we were complaining against. Right. But by just sitting there and not really going and exploring, you know, and that's, this mm -hmm. is always what great art does, right? It doesn't close the mind. It opens the mind, mm -hmm. you know, and it gets you, uh, what, what's the, I, I've cited this before, but it was John Kleinig um with uh with his teacher herman sasa mm -hmm. right and he and he went to sasa after when he was a student it's like i got distracted during the sermon today and i went off on the, you know and I, I missed most of it and i mm -hmm. feel guilty about it and he's like why 
Yeah. <laughs> that was the spirit working. And you're like, oh, mm -hmm. I mean, it's really kind of a remarkable story. And we forget that, 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 you know, we're not, we're not being put into a, like, into a little box, but right. like even our conversation here is meant to stimulate more conversation. Right. Right. And because we don't know what's going on in each individual hero's Correct. life and, mm -hmm. you know, how this might affect them. Mm -hmm. uh, we hope it does. We can only reflect on, you know, how it affects us, right. and our response to it, whatever right. we're reading for the day. <clears throat> exactly. Which brings us back to Haman. This is our final episode on Haman. Promise. We, promise. We have to finish the fourth metaphor. We have to get through the four metaphors. What metaphor. are we going to do next? What did you have in mind? Are we going to do the the Nietzsche or should we go further back to like Hegel or Kant? That's a good question. We could do Hegel, his theological I think we writings. should do Hegel because Hegel is the he's root. less atheistic. <laughs> so oh, there may be... I know, I know, that? I know. <laughs> Depends on how you want to define that. Well, in in the way of like Haman's critique, right? Yeah. Which is yeah. these guys are claiming. I think I think Haman would say, yeah, they're claiming to be religious or mm -hmm. spiritual, absolutely. And yet they're yeah, with moving. They all got out with their their master's degree in divinity, right? But they're ending up <clears throat> way me. away from what I'm reading in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And yet <clears throat> they were incredibly popular in their day, and after yeah. the fact. Oh yeah, everybody went to Hegel's lectures. <clears throat> it is spring, and uh, that means that the pollen is out in force. You need one of those those cough buttons on your microphone. I do. I've, I've thought about that quite often, actually. I had to actually edit the Warrior Priest on Wednesday because I kept clearing my throat and had to go through <laughs> and just chop out most I of I do those. edit the audio version of this, but not the video. Yeah. Yeah. So, I apologize. Right. So, the fourth metaphor that Haman addresses... It pervades the London writings, as John Kleinig explains this, is the biblical picture of divine advocacy, the speaking of Jesus and the Holy Spirit for people in their hearts. This carries great weight for Haman because it is the key to his understanding of his singular spiritual reorientation in London. And for those who haven't listened to the previous three episodes, it was in London while he was essentially destitute and working as a tutor that mm -hmm. Haman read the Bible and essentially was converted from thinking he was a Christian or believing he was a Christian to actual biblical faith. I wonder if, uh, you know, it wasn't the Bible in the drawer. <clears throat> Who leaves those? The Gideons? The Gideons, yeah. <laughs> That's a joke. I'm being, trying to be funny. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it is. <clears throat> well, there's a lot of people that still put credence to that. Well, however, <clears throat> should we talk about that? What does the sure Gideon Bible offer that um, um, that I think is widely neglected? Is that if you go to the back, it has mm -hmm. a, it has a catechism of a sorts. It so has even a the catechism Gideon of a sorts, right? It's Baptist, but yes, or Baptist -y, I suppose. Well, let's put it this way: the Gideons assumes the fundamental principles of American evangelical Christianity. It's threefold: one, the denial of original sin. Which, of course, then is the denial of the bondage of the will in matters of salvation. We're, oh no, we're going to make <clears throat> two, some people upset with this. Go on. Two, the advocacy for some, if not total, free will in matters of salvation. Correct. Which, by denying original sin, sets you up to you have affirm to, free yeah, will. Yeah, yeah. And three, that the sacraments are not efficacious. They're simply symbols. They represent something, but they do they not. They barely even mention them, as a matter of Correct. fact. Correct. Even baptism, yeah. So you have the denial of original sin, the advocacy for free will, and the rejection of the efficacy of the sacraments. So the assumption then is that if I pick up a Bible and read it, I will be converted. Now, converted to, to what be, though, right? This is my point. <clears throat> there are two types of conversion. And this is biblical. One is conversion according to the law. Or as my professor said, conversion through gritted teeth. Conversion in the way of the law is conversion toward the hidden God. The God that is not preached, revealed, and worshipped in Christ. It's kind He's of worship. what the the ascent that God is real and yes, that His word God is, is real. true. God is Almighty, mm -hmm. but God is not for me. Correct. Yeah. Because according to Paul in Romans, faith comes through hearing, and hearing comes through a preacher, and the Holy Spirit then has to send a preacher to you, and then He wraps Himself in those words that He gives the preacher to proclaim, right. and then you are converted. Because we distinguish between God outside of Christ, outside of his word, his promise, and God inside his word in Christ. So, in so the this, is, of Christ. Th this is my question <clears throat> with Haman, right? I mean, mm -hmm. how does he come to 
really this this biblical understanding, we would mm -hmm. say Lutheran even, I mean, sharing our confession, right. right? Unless he had that kind of reorientation. He definitely had a preacher. There had to have been. There had yeah. to have been a preacher. Right. I mean, wherever that was, or whether it was Whoever, like in his yeah. youth or... No, I mean you... the present tense. It, it can't be a past tense faith. It has to be present tense mm -hmm. because the gospel is always present tense. Yeah. I mean, we this, would we yeah. would argue that like if you did like somehow manage to start with Romans mm -hmm. or Galatians or something, yeah, it's going to orient you. It's uh, the text does orient you that way. Mm -hmm. And yet we know how many you know how many traditions read right. it un what unfaithfully, I guess. Well, here's an example since you brought it up. How the old Adam reads the fruits of the Spirit as these are the fruits that I must produce to demonstrate that I have the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Versus the genitive, which <laughs> is of the spirit. This is the fruit that the Holy Spirit produces. Right. Period. Or like we talked about when we read Romans seven, Paul saying in the indicative in the present tense, this is what I do and what I don't do, and then we interpret that as no, that's pre-conversion Paul doing the naughty things, but post-conversion Paul, he's all about the Holy Spirit and love. It was like it's literally a simple matter of just ignoring the grammar. I suppose I should just look up. Uh, Kleinig's footnote and say, well, what does it actually say in his thoughts on the course of my life? <laughs> yeah. Where he talks about his conversion. Uh, so when see you if read there's a, a Bible, for example, in a hotel room, let's say, mm -hmm. and, right. and I went through this experience myself, so I'm speaking from personal experience. I read the Bible, apart from a preacher, outside of Christ, outside of God's promise to be for me in the forgiveness of sins. And it drove me then, one, to fear and hopelessness, because now I believed in a God, who but was from what I had read in the Bible, right? Yes, yeah. he's terrible. And I read about him killing tens of thousands of Assyrians in the night. I read about him murdering all the firstborn children in Egypt. I read Jesus say, "Woe to you Pharisees!" and flipping over tables and condemning the disciples for their unbelief. Fiery serpents in the wilderness. Yeah. And yeah. it drove me, thank God, to a preacher. It drove me to someone who could proclaim Christ and the gospel to me. But. I think what Haman goes through in the similar sense of, oh, the Holy Spirit is an advocate. Okay, what does he advocate for? Well, he advocates for Jesus and the gospel and the gifts of salvation. Okay, so then what do I advocate for? Well, I advocate for the works of the flesh, for the denial of God being God pro me. And so you can read the Bible and you can do it apart from a preacher. However, Scripturally speaking, apart from a preacher, what you're going to encounter is God outside his promises, outside of Christ. Because as I said, the gospel is always present tense and it's always unconditional and it's always for you for the forgiveness of sin. Yep. There is no such thing as a past tense gospel or a future tense gospel because your past tense sins are not the problem. Neither are your future tense sins. Those don't exist. They're not even real. There's no such thing as past and future. They're abstractions. There's only the present tense moment in which you bear your sin because you have not been faced up to the cross of Jesus where your sin is nailed. And so apart from a preacher to point you to the sacraments, for example, the body and blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of sin, new life and eternal salvation, your sins are stuck on you because you can't just put your sins in the pages of the Bible. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. You can't have, I can't say, hey, Chris, I need you to take my sins. <laughs> you can't do that. One, it's or codependent. To, or, or to try to get rid of them yourself. Yeah, right? or how did you get rid of yours? How do you have such a clean conscience? Yeah. It's like when <laughs> Paul writes that I find no claim against me, right? That there's no, like, I, I see no sin in myself that you can make that claim against me. You're like, what? <laughs> like, what are you saying? Well, because he's been absolved. <laughs> right, right. That's why he makes that statement. Right. But in himself, he can't make that statement. I don't know any, anything against me. And you know that's tongue-in-cheek, right? Right, of course. He's yeah. being rhetorical. But nonetheless, <laughs> he is emphasizing a point that apart from a preacher declaring the forgiveness of sins to you, it's like uh, Paulson said in that one essay, God makes his word clingable. Yeah. When, God, when God's word touches you, it clings to you. So, so here's your answer. Mm -hmm. um, you'll have to pick up the book. <clears throat> so I, I should remind the listeners that there is the book. Hey, Caleb. London. <laughs> the London Writings, the Spiritual Theological Journal of Johann Georg Hamann. Um, yeah, so uh, actually in the section that's cited here in the footnote, the thoughts on my course of life where he, he describes his conversion, kind of how he got there. And, um, he notes all the people along the way, of course, 
Like there you go. The German Baron von Porne Porneal. I don't even know who this guy no, I is. Pronounce that correctly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, Lady von Pearl in London. She met. He mentions the family that he ended up staying with. That, nice. that gave him a gave him a basically a room to stay in and hmm. fed him. <laughs> Mister and Missus Collins, good people. Right. He talks about the people, and then eventually at the end, he's like. Uh, after he discovered the scriptures, then he goes and he ends up in church. Look at that. How's that? There you go. <laughs> Surprising, right? And the there law it is. You to the gospel. How amazing. I visited the preacher at the Savoy Church, Mr. Piteous. Uh, <laughs> Johann Reichard Piteous was pastor of St. Mary's German Evangelical Lutheran Church in Savoy. <laughs> a devout, righteous pastor whose words I heard, understood, and received with much emotion. <laughs> He took away from me all hope of finding employment here without making me feel downcast by this because I believe that I cannot be helped by the people, but by God. I'm only laughing because it sounds like something Lewis would do for Pilgrim's Progress Revisited. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's, it's of that era, right? Yeah. If our soul find, first finds its center in him, in, mm -hmm. in God, then it no longer abandons him in its motion. It remains true to him like the earth with the sun. And all other inclinations are governed like the moon by the original proper influence of this orbit and its and this and its course. So mm. he uses the, the pattern of the motion of the planets as yeah. being like if we're oriented towards God, then everything else takes its course sure. as God directs, which is beautiful, right? Yeah. But he did, yeah, he found a preacher. So to the there answer. You go. So the key mm. then to understanding his spiritual reorientation, mm -hmm. as you noted, that he literally has his compass point reconfigured to true north to Christ. And then just to his or overall regular devotional life of meditation and prayer, Holy Spirit, the advocate. Yep. <clears throat> so Haman's use of this image presupposes that spiritually speaking, each human soul is by nature deaf and dumb, both deaf and dumb. By itself and unaided by God's word, to my point, the soul is unable to articulate what it feels and what it needs from God. <clears throat> That's my sermon this Sunday on prayer. Yes, Jesus actually says... You actually don't know how to pray. <laughs> so here's how you're going to pray. It's amazing. It's like the Israelites begging Moses to pray for them. <laughs> like, ask God not to kill us anymore. Right, and think about how ashamed people are about this. <clears throat> yeah. Pastor, I just don't know how to pray. Can you just pray for me? I'm like, and, and, and they, they're ashamed about it. And, mm -hmm. and maybe you shouldn't be because, um, no, we as pastors have to, um, well... <laughs> Learn the discipline, I would say. Yeah, it's absolutely. it. We're we are learned. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's put on us. I mean, you have to yeah. just you just yeah. Mm -hmm. You're given the words to speak sometimes. Most I would time, say this all the time. <laughs> when I was first quote unquote converted and going through that process, mm -hmm. first couple of years even, Lord, I just prayers, wanna. My prayers were very formal, because Ooh. it's God after all, and so let's be formal. It's now not I just a bad talk place to, to start, right? I don't think so. I think it's a great place to start because you're working it out. You're praying the Psalms. You're trying to figure out how to pray. Yeah. The language. Again, you don't know how to pray. I mean, it was, I that's what they did at seminary. Um, I had somebody wisely just say to you, hey, here's the pattern of a collect. Mm -hmm. Now write, write a collect, right? Yeah. And it takes some discipline and it takes mm -hmm. some uh, meditation to kind of think it through and look for scripture right. or whatever. But but that's, <laughs> that's a form of prayer. It's not the only form, but it's a good form to learn. <laughs> <laughs> so that yeah, you have, thousand. yeah, so that you have, um, you know, some structure, right? Right. So you get to the point ultimately too, right? That's a nice thing about a collect form is it, it's very well, pointed. What you notice in the old Adam's prayers is they're all transactional. They're all begging for something that you don't actually need a lot of the time. Or if it is something you need, like sobriety, for example, mm -hmm. you negotiate with God. Because that's the that is the orientation to use Haman's language of the new of the old Adam, whereas the reorientation that comes with the Holy Spirit is I just talk to God now, I just talk to my Father and I call right. him that. Right, and this is what the colics, the good colics anyway, do. Yeah, as they say, on what basis mm -hmm. can I ask for these things? Where has God right. promised me? Right, that's it. And then so that orients faith towards the mm -hmm. promises, and then you pray dependent right. upon. The well, I noticed this in, in preparing the collects because I use White Dietrich's collects mm -hmm, right. and looking at other collects throughout our Lutheran tradition. So many are Lord God, Almighty God, not Heavenly Father. And it's something that I do on purpose then is that I take that out and put Heavenly Father at the beginning of every collect. Because again, like you eh, said... You could use people, any, any of the names or titles of God though. 
Like I, I try to use so. one. I try to use one that's appropriate to what I'm asking, right? So if you're asking for healing, great mm -hmm. physician, you could. Use okay, I get that. Like that. Sure, you're using analogies, right? But I'm right. talking about in the sense of my people are afraid to pray. They don't know how to pray. Because they but don't they think also, of him as father. They don't have a familiar relationship with him. Or, of, or as a loving father. <laughs> or as a, specifically a loving father, because you have a lot of abuse victims, a lot right. of people who didn't like their dad, or, a lot of people who are actually dads who are not proud of their parenting. Mm -hmm. Delinquency. And, yeah. Right. And, and Luther even talks about this in the sense of, and Paulson talks about this in his sermon on prayer, which I'm ripping off for this Sunday, is it's not a metaphor. Father isn't a metaphor. It's not an analogy that describes <laughs> God. He literally wants to be known only as your father. And it affects your, your responsibilities, your vocation within the fourth commandment then, because then you understand, I'm not this child's father, I'm this child's caretaker. And the term father has been bequeathed to me by my heavenly father for a, a time and a place. By, by the authority invested in me. Exactly. And mm -hmm. that this thing that, well, as, as has been said by uh, grandparents, well, I'm always their mom. I'm all, no, you're not. I'm sorry, but you're not. As soon as they get married and have babies, they're in the fourth commandment and you're not anymore. And that's a hard lesson for the old Adam to learn, which is you don't get to dominate God's commandments. They don't justify you. They don't make you righteous. Yeah, but you know what it says, the, the man mm -hmm. shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and become right. one flesh. So Correct. literally you lose your sons to another family. Correct. Even though we have it the opposite way. That you lose your daughters to another Yeah, your daughter family. marries, takes on the husband's name. They go to the husband's family for... I've, 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 yeah, I've thought this through quite well since I have a daughter that's married off. And I'm yes. like, hmm. Right. No, we do it backwards. Okay. Yeah, the man leaves his mother and father and cleaves to his wife and they become one. To family. start a new family. To start a new family. And then we just reversed it. We're like, mm, I don't think so. In fact, if you read the entirety of the history of Israel, it's always, well, the oldest one has to stay because he inherits the family business and the rest of you just go figure it out for yourselves. And they can't really usually get rid of them anyway. Right. I mean, th again, think of Esau and Jacob and how right. that plays itself out. I was right? thinking it's, of Jacob's sons too. Yeah, and Jacob's it's like, sons. It's like God says it. It's a promise. This is the way it's going to be. And then almost immediately they flip it. Mm -hmm. They bring the wives into the house. Yeah. Uh, it's all the sons. We were and talking then you got about, all these power games. and yeah. Right. We were talking in Bible study last week. I said, if you just read Genesis 1 and then reverse everything in Genesis 1, you'll understand the world. <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty true yeah. you know we worship the sun god says it was the evening and morning the first day so there was two lights we're like now nah, there's one <laughs> like there's water above water below now nah, there's just water below well this is how i govern the seasons and i don't think so <laughs> we're going to create incandescent light bulbs so we can work 24 7. man was created for the sabbath not the sabbath for man mm -hmm. da -da 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 -da. i'm sorry vice versa man yeah right yeah. no i know what you meant yeah we just reverse everything well, I was, what, what was, who was I talking to? I was talking about, I actually, I think I was talking to the children in the school of how, you know, the hubris of, of, uh, of children, right? And now, mm -hmm. and now we've reversed that where we have the worship of, of children, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But I said, there's nothing to me, I, actually, I was saying this more to the teachers. I said, there's nothing, I think, more ungodly than to like turn children into activists. Yes. 100%. That dishonor their parents and others' authorities ultimately. Right. Right, and that obviously that was uh, you can thank Mr. Marx for that, and Mal mm -hmm. picked up on that too. Yeah. And, yeah. Oh, actually, I think uh, Lennon and Stalin did too. Yeah, yeah they did. Yeah, it's it's always you. It's always youth revolts. It's mm -hmm. always youth revolts. Right. Take the malleable, the the people who are mm -hmm. outside of, you know, they haven't yet gained the wisdom. Right. You know, that wisdom hasn't necessarily been handed down to them mm -hmm. yet, and then ugh. look and at it's the demonic. posters. It's destructive. Look at the posters. It's always some man or woman with their hand on the shoulder of the child looking towards the rays of light coming from off the picture, looking to the future, it's bright. That's why I keep waiting for like, I mean, obviously we get this from the, the Disney uh, uh, Mickey Mouse Club people, you know, mm -hmm. when they get older and they're like, yeah, I renounce all of that. You right. know, it, was, it was terrible, but I, I'm waiting for Greta. I'm waiting for Greta, you know, Von Thunberg. Well, every know. once in a while she says something off script and they, mm -hmm. it goes viral. I'm just waiting for her to just completely go off the reservation. Oh, 100%. It's like, yeah, it was all, it was all a gag. And, of course. You know, I was being manipulated and, Mm -hmm. We all know it. It's just uh, we want her to say it. She's probably Soon. contractually obligated to continue the exactly. Line She's at got the an NDA. Yep. <laughs> she has handlers. So by itself and unaided by God's word, then the soul is unable to articulate what it feels and what it needs from God. It is so burdened and tongue-tied that it cannot pray. Well, there you go. Mm -hmm. Let alone articulate its utter woe and its deepest needs. 
just a reminder that I haven't actually read this. So I'm reacting in real time with the people that are listening to it. <laughs> so right. my little asides, I'm literally just going, oh, geez, we, okay, good. <laughs> yeah, right. And again, this is Kleinig uh, summarizing yeah. Haman so far. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just nice that your elders say it and then you agree with them and find out after the fact, okay, that's good. Right. Yeah, it means well, you actually maybe here. listened and learned. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so the best, the best that the old Adam can do is to resort to inarticulate groans and sighs, like in the slave pits in Egypt. Like the abyss of the primeval world in its natural state, the soul is shapeless and void. So dark that no one but God can look into it and see what is there. That's beautiful. Yeah. It's grim, but it's beautiful. <laughs> he does not just see but hears the soul's inarticulate cries. Hmm. Just as a mother hears and interprets the cries of her infant child. I've got, uh, let's see, a three, I've got a five-year-old, I've got a 13-year-old that are all functionally nonverbal since we don't usually understand any of the things they say. Sure. So I appreciate, you know, this yeah. kind of, uh, this picture, right? 100%. It's like, it's well, like the child who just keeps saying it and just gets yeah. angry because you don't seem to understand, but that's not God, right. right? Well, think of the comfort in this too, to your point. This means then that those who are unable to communicate verbally mm -hmm. or even physically with sign language or something else. They're nonverbal. Or you have people who are catatonic, young or old, that maybe you can't reach them with your words. Maybe they can't comprehend or they're not capable of comprehension. Right. But it doesn't matter because the creator, the father, not only hears but sees Right. Into and you the soul. And you have the and you have the son and the spirit interceding for them. Exactly, the advocate. Mm -hmm. With words. So just as the mother hears and interprets the cries of her infant child, so our Heavenly Father, because where is the resonance of the Holy Spirit? It's in the soul. Mm -hmm. It's the seat of life. And so you may not be able to see into the soul because you are sinful and have the old Adam hanging around your neck all the days of your life, as Luther says. But God is not interfered with in his work for you in his advocacy for you. And so his promise must reach into the soul. And so he sends his Holy Spirit into the depths, into what is shapeless and void, just as in Genesis chapter one. Mm -hmm. And so if you wanna know what the Holy Spirit is doing with your soul, same thing he was doing in Genesis chapter one. Yeah. He was over the deep and he gave it form. He said, let there be light. And so if you've ever been told this, cause I've heard this been actually said, in the past, thankfully I haven't heard it recently, that those who cannot affirm their faith cannot be saved. Ugh. Or, yeah, I know, right? Or that you're not allowed to commune at the Lord's table if you can't confess your belief that this is the body and blood of Jesus, verbally. Even though I know people, and I myself have asked people, just yes or no, with your sign language, yes or no, or just nod your head. Do you believe this is the body and blood of Jesus? Now, I've been told by the pastors then that that's not a confession. And I'm like, do you have no faith whatsoever in the Holy Spirit and his work? Uh, that, the answer is, generally no. speaking, no. Because <laughs> here's a child, and we both know uh, a child who has to communicate with an iPad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? And you just touch the screen and it says yes or no. And so you would look at this child and say, well, this person is not capable of comprehension and not capable of understanding and knowing the question. And yet every time you ask, yes. Do you believe this is the body and blood of Jesus? Yes. <laughs> Do yeah. you believe it? Yes. <clears throat> <clears throat> Again, the foundation of American evangelical religion is to deny not only that the sacraments are uh, efficacious, which also means God's promise is not efficacious, but you're also assuming that she has free will to make that confession in the first place. Well, and I think, I think it's even worse <clears throat> than that because, um, you know, as much as they might speak of the Holy Spirit, their view of the Holy Spirit is not all that different than medieval Roman Catholicism. Right. Straight which is up. like, the Spirit is like just the spark that gets the fire going. Yeah. Didn't we used to sing a song about that? I remember. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It only takes this way. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. Right, exactly. And so then, so the idea is, that it's coupled with free will, that you get the little spark and then, but then you have to take it across the finish line, in other words. Right, exactly. The, yep. Yeah. He, he like, what is he? <clears throat> He's like the guy that takes the kick off and kind of runs it. And then from there on out, it's it's your responsibility, along with your pastor and your church and yeah. your parents and whatever. Well, we're the blockers. We block for the punt returner. Or the oh, there returner. you go. Okay. Right. Yeah. Oh, you're the returner? No, and, we're the blockers. The, who's the individual that catches it? Okay. Each individual Christian's got to catch the ball and run with it. Right. 
And there's some help along the way, but you gotta you gotta be the one. You gotta carry it across. You know? And that's not wonderful news, as no. Paul says here. No, no, that's not. No. That wouldn't be wonderful news. It's terrible. It's it's tar breaking. It's crushing. And because you're left with the hidden God again, you're le- left with God outside of Christ, outside of His Word. So right. You're just left with death. You mean not even an arm tackle? This yeah. is like a, a full on full body yeah. tackle. Take, yeah. take you down to the ground. Yeah. You've got a concussion and you're not getting yeah. up again. It's like the uh, welcome to the NFL videos I like to watch. <laughs> <laughs> I've not seen these. Can, these sound yeah, great though. Yeah, it's where a running back cuts left when he definitely should have cut right and just ends up with a 260 pound linebacker full up in the air, slammed to the ground, just laying there staring up at the sky, wondering if it was worth it. I know people mock the NFL and maybe for good reason, but mm-hmm. uh, there is something about the violence of it that just seems like it belongs in this oh. life. Well, I told you, my, my favorite new thing to do is watch pacifist watch MMA fights. <laughs> it's fantastic. It, just, it pleases me to no end. Right. It's the same. Well, they all well, insist that this isn't normal. This isn't natural. I think it was Jocko who said on uh, Unraveling that, uh, you know, that whoever realized <laughs> that MMA is just like, let's like take all the part about the sport that people actually enjoy and just yeah. take that out and just do that. Yeah. <laughs> Just do like, that, that fight you watch part. hockey for the fights. Mm-hmm. So just just have the fight. Like, just why do you need all the hockey exactly. part? Right. It's kind of like, I mean, think about NASCAR. What would be the equivalent to NASCAR, the, uh, which has really seen a downturn, apparently. Um, oh, it's like the, the the derbies, right? Where they just, yeah. it's like, that's what people actually want to see. <clears throat> they don't care about you running around in a circle for, for an hour or no. two or three. No, 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 no. Goon. That's the movie I was thinking about. You ever watch the movie Goon? Mm-mm, it's no. a fantastic comedy. It's a really great movie, actually. It's one of those that you just turn on to watch to pass the time on a Sunday afternoon and it turns out to just be a classic. Hmm. But it's, yeah, it's it's about a hockey player who can't play hockey, but he's really good at fighting. No, <laughs> And there so you that's go. what they hire him for is just to be a, like, he can barely skate, actually. He's yeah. so bad. What do they call that? Not the defender, the um, enforcer, I think, is what they yeah, call that. Yeah, he's called the enforcer or the goon. The goon. That's the movie. The name of the movie is Goon. It's fantastic. Well, and it's never, your, it's never your best players. And he's not supposed to go after the best players, too. There's rules, right? Right. There's rules. Exactly. <laughs> Watch the movie. That and Slapshot. Two best hockey movies ever made. Okay. The best it can do, then, is resort to inarticulate groans and sighs, and therefore the Holy Spirit, as he did over the abyss in Genesis 1, does the same for you, just as a mother hears and interprets the cries of her child. So Haman writes this. God hears us cry out when the devil seems to titillate us in the midst of our sins. God hears our cries when the sleep and intoxication of sin lets us think about nothing but ourselves. He thinks about us even more. He knows our neediness. This need of ours is the cry which God needs to hear us. How wretched would the young ravens themselves be if God would wait so long as to provide their food only when they were starving and began to cry out to him for it. Mm. Nothing would grow old enough in the world to be able to use its voice. We would go hungry before our tongue would learn to stammer. As a mother understands the speechless cry of her child, so God feels our hunger and thirst, our nakedness and impurity. Yeah, like newborn babes. Yeah, that's fantastic. Mm Mm-hmm. In that situation, Jesus comes to aid the soul with his Holy Spirit, to bring light into the deep darkness and order into the inner chaos. He comes in the guise of a voice that arises in the human soul, a voice that Satan tries to silence, which, reading about that and thinking about it now, Mm. I think that's part of the reason we fear the woods and why in like Grimm's fairy tales, the original ones, unabridged, unedited, the woods are always a place of of fear and, and terror. And you never go into the woods. Because they're wild. They're wild, just like God. Mm -hmm. And so what do we do with the woods? We tear them down and we erect woods that are safe, consistent, trustworthy. Because uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne, one of my favorite authors, and his short stories are fantastic because he's writing in the colonial period. And parents told their kids, you never go into the woods because there's all kinds of things in the woods that can gobble you up. And they brought that from... Europe. They brought that from the old country with them, along with the goblins and the fairies and the trolls and the witches and all the monsters. You don't even, I mean, you don't even need the mysticism though. I no. mean, obviously there's, there's poisoned, you know, yeah. plants and yeah. Yeah. Poisoned all berries and, and all kinds of pitfalls. Mm-hmm. And then what it, what it, it leads me to then is this is why not only do we fear the woods, we fear that, that darkness and that chaos, but that's then also why we create gods 
hmm. that that occupy the woods. This is why Beowulf, again, if you listen to Warrior Priest, you know, Beowulf, where do where does Grendel and his mother come from? They come from out there in the woods, right? And where do you not go? You don't go out there in the woods because Grendel will get you. That's where the monsters are at. Right. And so you have to find almost a demigod in the form of Beowulf to go into the woods and fight for you because, well, I'm not going out there. So we need someone who's larger than life, more human than human, to go fight the monster in the woods. Rather than, as he's pointing out, where is God located? Well, you noted it too. He's located out there in the wilds, in the wilderness, in the wilderness. Wilderness doesn't mean desert. It means the wild places, the places without law, the mm -hmm. place that is untamed, and right. the place where if you go out there, you're not the apex predator, you're not at the top of the food chain, this is the wild place. Mm -hmm. And so my um, my favorite story ever is Where the Wild Things Are, Marie Sendak, because I grew up with it. And to this day, I can tell you the whole story, page by page, right? I remember every page of the story, I remember all the illustrations, because it traumatized me as a four-year-old. Yeah. Like I remember discovering that book and having my aunt and my grandma read it to me. It traumatized me. He horribly. just recently died, didn't he? Like last year, maybe? Did he? Yeah. That sounds about right. I think so. Yeah. But where the wild things are, what do they want to do with Max when he goes there? Well, you got to stay because you're a king, right? And the whole thing's a metaphor. The whole thing's an analogy. Um, just like the runaway bunny. As analogy for, most children's books are. Most children, yeah. Which is and why they're though, also, yeah, right. you need to be cautious with the children's books. The irony book. is that Maurice Sendak hated children. <laughs> and he actually wrote about that in a letter to a child. He's like, I actually don't like children, and now I've been cursed to be a children's author. <laughs> so he was born to Polish Jewish parents. Mm -hmm. uh, most of his family died in the Holocaust, uh, which they suggest that that traumatized sure. him. You think? He, he was inspired to be an illustrator after watching Fantasia. So that's nice. cool. Yeah, I, didn't, I don't know all of this. I have mm -hmm. not looked into this. Uh, where the wild things are. Da, 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 da. That was his first. That was his yep. first. Yep. Well, it was a throwaway. Uh, yeah. A Basically. boy who rages against his mother for being sent to bed without any supper. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And after I became a Christian and went back and reread where the wild things are, just like with the runaway bunny, I was like, oh, even if Sendak wasn't aware of what he was doing, he was doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it's a, yeah. what, what is it? The, the transcendent narratives? You know? Yeah. Yeah, just work their way out. In, well, and in as life. Josh says on the live stream, Saruman tore down the trees. He did. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think we pointed Same out thing was, with Princess Mononoke. Yeah, we, we talked about this a couple episodes ago, mm -hmm. I think, um, in regards to oh how Saruman then as as he had to leave um, Isengard ended yeah. up in the Shire and did the same thing there. Right. Exactly. You know, so he's the prototypical. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Industrialist? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. he is the he is the one behind the door that the Lorax is trying to get to. So let's see. Oh, I was I was looking up whether he died. Yeah, he died in 2012. Okay. There you go. That was the answer I was looking for. But that's my point is that bringing this back up again in, in Haman's language is that this is where God is located. He is located out in the wild places. Yeah. Which we see with the patriarchs in particular because he's constantly sending them out in the middle of nowhere. Well, and here it's in it's in the deep darkness of the of mm -hmm. the inner chaos of the individual, yeah. right? Right. He looks into the the chaos in your own heart. Well, I think that's why we're afraid of the forest, the wild places, because it's it's a mirror, it's the mirror of the. Oh, law. it's the reflection it of our of our fear. Yeah. Yeah, it's, you know what's going on on the inside. Uh, you're projecting that out onto creation. Mm hmm. Hmm. Yeah. That's heavy. And so the yeah the the woods come to represent our relation to God outside of Christ and outside of his word, which is that wild, untamed God who's going to come charging through the trees like some gargantuan beast to devour us, which is Maybe. exactly why the man and woman <laughs> hide behind the trees. Yeah. He's coming to kill us. So the word, God's son, the object of our faith is near in the mouth. We cannot pray except in his name and in the spirit of his mouth. Yes, this same spirit that teaches us to pray gives us the food for our souls and the hunger for him in the divine word. The spirit forms him in our heart, acts so that Jesus may gain shape there, prepares the heart and voices, the sighs that we do not utter and we are unable to utter. This is Romans 8, 28 language. Mm -hmm. So that one is in our mouth and heart in whom we live and move and have our being, Colossians, 
and only his spirit can make the testimony of his love for humankind and our salvation in him so understandable and pleasing to us that we hear it in faith and live by faith according to it. There it is. Mouth, word, ears, faith. Right. And just, you know, how he has that passivity of, you know, of receptive, right? Receptivity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just to receive it. I was looking to see what the citation was. 106. All right. Oh, it's on Romans. <laughs> Deuteronomy and Romans, yeah. Yeah, there we go. Noise. That's beautiful. The yeah, because he's, he's, he's yeah. bringing all of those texts together. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's worthy of saying again is this is the quote unquote Lutheran hermeneutic is we don't cherry pick. We read the scriptures as a whole. Mm -hmm. And so if we quote a verse, we're quoting it in relation to the entirety of scripture. Right. And so if Paul says faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of God, that better be in other places in scripture. Otherwise, we just discredit Paul. Mm-hmm. Scripture has what is it called its own internal logic. Is that the way we say it? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, you know, or a fabric. It's woven together. Yeah, it has its own rules, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think uh, we post internal a logic ago now, but yeah. there's a meme online you can find where it shows all the interconnections in the Bible, and it's all different colored lines. Oh yeah, and it's like tens of thousands of lines. It's it's amazing. It looks like fiber optic cable. It's right. Really well, it's self-referential. Yeah, there it is. Self-referential. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the voice that is heard in our heart is in fact the combination of three voices, the voice of Jesus, the voice of the Spirit, and the voice of our own conscience. But the main voice is the voice of Jesus. He is our advocate, our inner spokesman, our speech therapist. Oh, that's a nice analogy. I like that. Yeah. The only thing I could say, and I'm sure I hear he's going to clarify as we go here, but you could hear this as Jesus spoke to my heart. Mm -hmm. I don't need a preacher. I don't need a church. I don't or need that the that. voice of the Spirit is distinct from the voice of Jesus. That too, yeah. Yeah. I mean, For, they're distinct yeah. persons, of course, mm -hmm. right? But what's the Spirit's job is to deliver Christ the voice of gifts, Jesus yeah. to us. Yeah. yeah. He is the breath. So by his voice in us, Jesus becomes our advocate, the advocate that the Israelites longed to have so that they could rightly fear and love God. The intercessor, yeah. yeah. Jesus turns our sighs into words and our groans into prayers that please him because they ask for what he wants to give us. The voice of Jesus is the voice of his blood that cries out for God to avenge his murder. But in an amazing reversal of expectations, Jesus does not cry out for God's vengeance on us, but on himself as our substitute. He therefore sprinkles our hearts with his blood which cries out to God for pardon and grace and assures us of that. Haman then concludes, quote, When we get to know ourselves, when we come to see ourselves almost as we really are, how we then wish, plead, fear for ourselves, how we then feel the need for all that God, without us knowing it, being interested in it and asking for any of it, has never grown tired of presenting to us offering to us and encouraging us, yes, frightening us to receive. <laughs> then we hear the blood of the Redeemer crying out in our heart. We feel that the bottom of it has been sprinkled with the blood that was shed for the reconciliation of the whole world. We feel that the blood of vengeance cries out for grace on our behalf. It's almost as if he knows the, the hymn, Glory Be to Jesus, right? Right. You know, with Abel's blood for vengeance, but the blood of... Uh... Jesus for yeah. our mercy cries, right? That's a very important final sentence, though, because mm -hmm. the the old Adam by nature is incapable of coming to that confession. We feel that the blood of vengeance cries out for grace on our behalf. We want Jesus to be Batman. Right. <laughs> yeah. Eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. Yeah. Just vengeance. Right. Always vengeance. Always justice. Right. That's why I'm, I, you know, I've, it's always struck me when the churches, especially, uh, was it last summer or two summers ago, you know, had all their quotes from the Bible about, you know, God is a God of justice and mm -hmm. whatnot, trying to support all the, the uh, justice warriors. I don't know, what, what what do we call that? Say? Social justice? Yeah, that was it. Yeah. You know, it's, I, you know, like, do you know what you're really asking for here? <laughs> you're asking for God to come and destroy you and everyone around you. Yes. If, if that's the Jesus you want, 
it's not the Jesus, you know, of the gospel. Exactly. Remember, that, that's right, in Batman Begins, when he hauls uh, Flass up the the cop, he hires the crooked cop, he pulls him up the zip line, right? Mm -hmm. and, he's, and he's interrogating him, and then Flass says, I swear to God, and Batman says, swear to me. Oh, wow, I forgot that line. Yeah. That's says, powerful. I swear to God, he's like, swear to me. And he drops him, and then at the last second stops him and lets him So, down. So what are we saying, Batman, is the manifestation of the hidden God? Yes. Absolutely. All 100%. vengeance, no mercy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's why he was created in the first place. <laughs> so as our advocate, he does not plead our innocence, but his guilt. That's great. He does not plead our innocence. Instead, he pleads his guilt, the guilt that he bears on our behalf before God the Father, with the penalty that he paid for us by his death. Oof. Hmm, he does powerful. not plead our innocence. Instead, he pleads our guilt on his behalf. It's his my guilt. guilt. Yeah, that's his, what I'm saying. It's, he's like, it's not their guilt anymore. It's mine. I take it. And I've suffered and I've died and I've paid the penalty. Right. Yeah. So in answer to his pleading, God has this to say to the human heart. The guilty conscience that fears God's punishment. Quote, here in your heart, in its depths, when my presence comes close enough to you, how the Israelite, an angel, groans, an angel who acknowledges that he is guilty, who beseeches me for grace, I will hear his voice, Deuteronomy 5. His words plead me, please me. He is an angel who cries out like the earth, which opened its mouth to receive the blood of Abel. There it is. Jeez. You know, we, we haven't talked is, about the conscience yeah, that much, have we? There's no way that anybody just sitting around reading the Bible is going to write this stuff. No, that's that's why I say this is remarkable. He's mm -hmm. he's had, um, he's had guidance. God has given him, you know, yeah, uh, preachers along the way. There's no way around it. Uh, what was I going to say? Oh, the conscience. We haven't talked. I mean, we've talked about it some somewhat here and there, mm -hmm. but the way that um, Kleinig and I think taking from mm -hmm. Haman is describing it is that your conscience, um, your sense of standing in relation to God and your neighbor, right? It, it there's a dialogue that happens with Correct. it. Correct. Yeah. Right. But the, the question is, who is it dialoguing with? Right. Well, are, yes. Are you dialoguing with the spirit, um, you know, by way, and then Jesus word, consequently? Or, or are you or are you dialoguing with the flesh? Right. Yeah. Is your conscience informed by what you feel and what you experience or what you think? Mm -hmm. Or is it being informed by what Jesus has said? Right. right? Just let your conscience be your guide. Right. And where's that going to lead you? Not good places. No, no. <laughs> Um, that's why that statement, like you need to find a way to forgive yourself, is so abhorrent, right? right? Because mm -hmm. what's what's your body going to? What is your flesh going to tell you? How are you going to find forgiveness in your flesh? You're not. Well, it's you impossible. might call. You'll have a uh, some. What do you want to say? Uh, imposter of of forgiveness that will be called right. vengeance, right? It's well, not forgiveness. It's vengeance. In psychological therapeutic terms, we refer to that as denial. Mm. <laughs> you are in denial. Right. 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 Well, I've come. I've come to find a way to live with it. There we go. That's not forgiveness. No, that's you still have it. Yeah, we locked it in the fruit cellar, and we're not going to open it again. That's it's the yeah. evil dead. That's what it because is. Because the, 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 the demon's locked in the closet. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we're not going to do that. They're still there. Yeah. Just don't open the closet. It's okay. Right. Yeah. But the what, what kind of uh, spiritual stress does that put you under? Well, since right? I'm on a, a kids' book kick, that's uh, Grover. There's a monster at the end of this book. Mm, there you go. Every page. Do not turn the page. Whatever you do, do not turn this page. And he draws ropes and there's bricks and there's all kinds of stuff, right? He's trying to stop you. I forgot about that book. And yeah. then you get to the end of the book and it's him. It's Grover. <laughs> Which, he's a lovable, cute, fuzzy, cuddly monster. And you're like, oh, that's the lie. The lie is that the monster at the end of the book is cute and fuzzy and cuddly and isn't going to devour you. That sounds like Monsters Incorporated now, too. There we go, yeah. You're, you're scared it. of them, but they're really just nice. They're just doing their job. Right, just doing their job. Hey. <laughs> Thanks for ruining Monsters Incorporated for a lot of people listening to this podcast now. <laughs> I mean, they are scary, but they're just doing their job. They're the SS of dreams. <laughs> <laughs> Don't fault them. They just follow our orders. The dream world. There we go. Yeah. yeah. Just doing our job. So here the mention of Jesus as an angelic mediator and intercessor recalls Job chapter 33, verses 23 through 28. As Haman notes in his account of his spiritual upheaval, 
He also heard another voice beside the voice that was groaning and wailing in the depths of his heart, like the voice of his murdered brother Jesus, a voice that reduced him to tears of repentance. It was the voice of the great interpreter, capital I, interpreter, who translated those sighs and groans into human speech, God's spirit who kept on revealing to him, still more and more, the mystery of divine love and the benefit of faith in our gracious only Savior. Ah, so, so I mean, just to say this very yeah. briefly, we have Jesus dying for the sins of the world, and this, the great interpreter of the Spirit is saying, that's for you. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. You're not innocent. He just took your guilt on himself. And it's the Spirit's ongoing job here, right? He kept yeah. on revealing. I love yeah. that. That's great language. Yeah. Well, it goes back to your point you just made then, that is, the Holy Spirit does not send us a preacher with words to say, oh, no, no, you're innocent now. You're not guilty anymore. Go in peace. You're fine. No, it's to say, no, you're still guilty, but your guilt's on Jesus. Mm -hmm. And every time I leave you alone, you try and take that back on yourself. Right. So hmm. it's not that the Holy Spirit comes to remind you that you're innocent. It's to remind you that you keep trying to tear your guilt and your sin and your death away from Jesus. Hmm. Because you just can't believe that... The blood of vengeance cries out for grace on our behalf. Well, and I think part of that too is probably we think of the cross as being this, you know, um, very specific historic event, which of course it is. Right. right. Um, but that it has no like transcendent um, benefit, yeah. past, present, and future. That it right. it doesn't it isn't what uh, provides the forgiveness and all the mm -hmm. ritual sacrifices that God appointed in the right. Old Testament. Mm -hmm. But it does in a, in a uh, what like a backwards temporal way, right? Yeah. It, it, it backfills all of all of the ways that God had shown mercy to His people right. in days of old, yeah. and then it's and then it's forward looking too. It's ongoing death for sin right. is is applied to Christians by the Spirit moving forward right. into in, until the last day. Right. But but we don't think of the cross that way. I mean, of course we do, and we talk about it. That's what kind of preaching we do. But yeah, I don't we know talk people, about it. Yeah. Right. I we preach Christ and Him crucified, past tense. You know, like. Okay, that's right, mm -hmm. but why? For the ongoing, regular, continual it's forgiveness of sins. interesting you bring sense. this up, because I was reflecting on this the other day as I was preparing a blog post for our, our friend Kelsey at 1517, is I always write everything in the present tense, mm -hmm. and then she corrects me and puts it in the past tense because that's the text, and it's literally just the preacher's switch in my brain that I'm like, well, this has no application to people if I don't make it present tense because it's for you in the present tense. It's not for them. We don't need to know the disciples got this. You need to know this for you in the present tense. And a yeah, lot I mean, of in one sense, this... I get it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Jesus died past tense right. for no, the I'm present tense I'm just saying I do it automatically. I'm not saying anything negative about Kelsey. She's just trying to stay true to the text. It's just that's my preacher's brain is constantly like, no, this has to be present tense too. It can't just be left in the past. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I just forget to go from the text to the present tense, and I just make the text present tense. Right, right. Because but it, I'm, you're trying to explain, like, Jesus is saying this to the disciples, and in saying it to them, he, he is saying it to you simultaneously. Right, yeah. It, it has yeah. that transcendent quality, because it's God's right. word. Right. So as Haman notes then about the spiritual upheaval, it's the voice of his murdered brother Jesus that reduces him to tears of repentance. And then it's the voice of the great interpreter, the Holy Spirit, the advocate, who keeps revealing to him the mystery of divine love, the benefit of faith in our gracious only Savior. Mm -hmm. The revelation in and of itself, for lack of a better term, is soul crushing. Yeah. Because you, it is revealed to you, I did this for you and it's impossible for you to do this. Which means if I don't choose you, if I don't elect you, you can't. Well, and there's that can't. there's that reality that you're never going to be comfortable with Good Friday, right? That too, yeah. I mean, you'll be comforted by it, but that's that's the work of the Spirit, as he's saying here. Right. Well, the discomfort I think is you're standing around going, "Isn't somebody going to do something about this?" And it's like, "Well, no, I couldn't. I can't do anything about it. It happened two thousand years ago. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? No, no, I wasn't. <laughs> Why didn't anybody stop the centurions? Why didn't anybody stop? You're right. Why didn't the disciples speak up? Why didn't anybody revolt? They called him king. They yelled, their, they shouted their mm -hmm. loud hosannas at him. Nobody did anything. Yeah. I, maybe if they knew. See, I don't know if, I think all the disciples certainly had a degree of skepticism. <laughs> oh, 100%. Um, yeah. But on the other hand, it's, I mean, he had prepared them to say, you know, there, there is an inevitability to this. 
right? right? Uh, it's going to happen. Right. And then when it does happen- There may happen, be a level of skepticism, but you did help him feed 4,000 people. Hmm, that's true. Then five. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the other things that, you know, we're talking about the interpreter. Um, mm -hmm. We've been praying or singing uh, to God, the Holy Spirit, let us pray, Luther's yeah. uh, hymn on yeah. prayer and the Spirit together. Yeah. He puts prayer yeah. and spirit together, which is beautiful. Um, but one of the names he gives to the Spirit is transcendent comfort, hmm. which is why I've been thinking about this idea of transcendent, is that the mm -hmm. Spirit comes um, and he, he's continually coming to comfort mm -hmm. us with, um, with Jesus' forgiveness. Yeah. Well, it goes hand in hand with what he wrote earlier about condescension that mm. he condescends to us so that he can transcend us. Oh, look at that. He has to come to us in order to lift us up. Look at all those big words. Right? Man, it got dark. <laughs> you probably got the storm that we had earlier this morning. Yeah, it's going to rain. Yeah. So we, however, can all pray and must all pray. And this is Haman writing now. We can all pray. We must all pray like Solomon because the spirit of prayer is the indispensable blessing and fruit of the faith that the Holy Spirit works in us. Right. If we don't know how to pray as we ought to, well, I got to go back because there's that sentence before that. I'm sorry. Haman discovered that the Holy Spirit was the spirit of prayer, the spirit who did not just help him to pray that night in London, but did so regularly. So he considers then Solomon's prayer of dedication for the temple. And so he says, we can all pray. We must all pray like Solomon because this spirit of prayer is the indispensable blessing and fruit of the faith that the Holy Spirit works in us. Why do we pray? Because the Holy Spirit makes us pray. This mm -hmm. is when, when you read the penitential Psalms, David voices this quite well. When I refused to confess my sin, your hand was heavy upon me <laughs> and essentially forced me to confess and pray to you for forgiveness. Well, and I've had this recently uh, with a, you know, a couple people who've finally, you know, they were brought by the Spirit back into the fellowship after COVID and it's yeah. taken a while. And, and I didn't do anything in particular, but like you said, it was the heavy hand that was laid upon them. Right. And then, but but the response of faith when they again are in the you know the presence of God's word and sacrament. Right. And they say, um, I you know, I need to be here. Right? Yeah. Exactly. I need to be here now. Mm -hmm. But but there's that there's that. I guess it's just the ignorance of unbelief, right? Where mm -hmm. you're just you just don't even know what you've lost until you've until right. you, you have don't know it what again. You've got till it's gone. Oh, that's the lyric I was looking for. Yeah. Yeah. You don't know what you've got till it's gone. It's uh, Cinderella, 1987 <laughs> or 88. And yes, I repent of that knowledge. I do. <laughs> I thought you even know what year it is. <laughs> I saw him in concert, yeah. Uh, with Poison. And uh, who else was with them? Well, Poison Winger. definitely needs repentance. Poison, Cinderella, and Winger. I think that was the I don't triple know, bill. She's only 17, was their big hit. Do you realize the the whole music industry was another psyop? Yeah, yeah, that's a whole conversation for a different day. But yes, <laughs> going back I to the fifties, that just clicked in my head. Yeah. The whole, ah. and then when it exceeded its usefulness, then it was just disbanded basically. Tossed aside, yep, exactly. Huh. In fact, I heard that last night in an interview that nobody. I was listening to the Black Keys on Rogan, and the Black Keys are like nobody knows what's going on anymore. The record industry has no idea how to make hits anymore. They don't know what what is popular and how to make someone popular and not popular. Well, all the just, mechanisms. Yeah, there's just too was... many. Too many. In fact, they, they named the second most popular song in the world as a TikTok. He's a musician, but he's on TikTok. And through TikTok, his song became, the, it's the second most popular song in the world. I've never heard of him or the music before. Well, they had that with, uh, with Let's Go Brandon, right? They had, yeah. <laughs> they had like yeah. three remixes in the top. Right top 10 and you're like right and this is just some guy on you kids on youtube yeah, and exactly yeah. it's out of their hands now it's transcended them <laughs> there we go well then you can't control the narrative though exactly that's what right. that's that's what i was pointing out is that the, right. the music was you know whether yeah, it was cinderella or whoever yeah right. yeah yeah used for ain't, social activism ain't nothing and but a good time yeah blood in the streets in the town of chicago yeah is that peace frog mm -hmm. it is yeah. There you go. Boom. The Doors. That's a great... Morrison Hotel not only is a great album, but Peace Frog's my favorite Doors song. It's by far my favorite of their albums. And some of them have uh, waned in their... Yes. Well, from just overexposure and overplay. I just... I mean, I, what I liked about The Doors, they were a little bit more raw than a lot of the other bands yeah. of their era. And and well, not I mean, quite... Yeah. With the jazz influence, it's yeah. kind of... 
Exactly. It's like, what's going on with that? And... No, I think Morrison Hotel was, for me anyways, I liked it just because it's so loose and raw. Like you said, it's sloppy. Yeah, right. But, it, but it's consistent top to bottom as an album. Exactly, 100%. No, it's fantastic. Whereas you get to like LA Woman, and like, yeah, LA Woman's a great track, but the album and but the But the guitars whole... and Peace Frog? Oh, yeah. Oof. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's nice. Chunky. Chunky. And I and we that and we're walking. There we go. So the uh so the prayer of our king and great high priest makes all our sighs, no matter how broken, how truncated, how short they may be, just as full, as rich, and as powerful as Solomon's rich royal offering that God accepted. Oh, that's lovely. Isn't that how encouraging, right? For the Christian. Right. Like, like, yeah, you woman... may not have the wisdom or the eloquence of Solomon, and yeah. yet the Spirit takes your words and and Jesus' right. word and Come, Lord these. Jesus, Lord have mercy. Right. There's no better prayer. And it's three words. There's no better prayer. Lord have mercy. We could come up with more words, though. We could, but we don't need to. I actually preached on this on Wednesday because I was using part of the high priestly prayer right. for <laughs> divine service. I'm like, right. okay, I know the disciples fell asleep later on in Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. I, I'm thinking they probably fell asleep there in the upper room, too. <laughs> oh, it's like I three chapters. Asleep constantly. Yeah. <laughs> right? Absolutely. And I, I was running with what uh, Paulson said in that sermon mm -hmm. that you're gonna yeah. that you're ripping off, where yeah. he was talking about that text in John 17, yeah. and how Jesus prays a long time. <clears throat> you're gonna give like, me eight or nine glasses of wine and then expect me to stay awake for three hours? You're out of your mind. <laughs> While you're praying, <laughs> I drink communion wine. I go home and take a nap. Like there's no way. No. <laughs> Plus, we've heard you before, dude. We know how this goes. It'd be, you know, it's been a long week too. Yeah, very long week. Sleepless yeah. nights, etc. It it's. As, as my my children even joke, they're like, "Dad, that's a really nice way of saying four letter words." But thank you, uh, Lord have mercy is my way of not swearing at my children. Mm -hmm. um, I learned living in Louisiana. You see, Lord have mercy. Um, but it just goes to the point. I had a, I had a widow ask me this a couple of years ago, and she's fantastic. But she she came to me and she said, "Pastor, I'm, I just I got to get this off my chest because it really upsets me. Every time I pray at night, I fall asleep while I'm praying." Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she asked, she's like, "Do you think God still hears my prayers?" I'm like. Lois, that's the most beautiful thing I've heard in a long right. time. Right. To fall yeah. asleep in prayer, literally, if you don't wake up, you're in the resurrection. Like mm -hmm. you go from praying to literally being in the resurrection in a, in a moment. Like that's the best thing that could possibly happen is that the Holy Spirit gives you such peace in that moment right. that whatever you're praying leads directly to sleep. Uh, as long as it's not like uh, when Paul's preaching, the guy falls out the window. <laughs> right, falls out the window and breaks his neck. Yeah, that part's not so good. I'm no. Yeah, maybe make sure you're well secured. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> In a pew or something. So the intercession of Jesus and the Spirit were so important for Haman that in his daily prayers he included a petition for Jesus to intercede for him before the Father, as well as for the Holy Spirit to prompt him to address God as his Father from his heart, as Jesus did, and turn his inarticulate sighs into heartfelt prayers. Oh. Full stop. Yeah. Wow. Well, that so that's the there's a whole text on prayer. Maybe I need to go and crib that for the uh, for Isn't my that nice? sermon, right? Oh, it's the it's the last thing in the book. It's the last yeah. thing in this section, yeah. No, it's the last uh, section of the book is a is a oh, thing okay. on prayer, where he does a comprehensive series of eight prayers, in which Haman prays for himself and his needs, his father, his brother, his former fiance. <laughs> hmm. Can you pray for your former fiance? I guess you can. Uh, his friends and relatives, his country and household, all households and their members, right? Yeah. So that's beautiful. So he's got eight prayers here at the end of the book. I'll have to hmm. look at these. There's lots of scripture references. Whew. Yeah. Nice. I'm not going to read him. No, it's good. Um, so I think the comfort here is just in the fact that you like Jesus warns, right? Don't be like the Pharisees who want to be heard for their many words and their many prayers. Yeah. Is that something as simple as simply praying, come Lord Jesus in the moment or praying, Lord, have mercy in the moment or praying, come Lord Jesus, be our guest or bless us, Father, in these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy bountiful goodness through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen, which we pray at table. Like these may seem like quote unquote children's prayers, but as I've noted, come Lord Jesus is the most apocalyptic thing that you could possibly ask for. <laughs> yeah. What's all wrapped up in that? Oh, right, yeah. Exactly. The clouds of heaven and right. darkness and the martyrs and thunder and, and lightning angels. and fire yeah. and yeah. yeah. It's a good time. Or it's, let's have it, dinner. I mean, either could, way. Yeah, yeah. Or we could eat. 
And, <laughs> but that's the faith that prays that prayer is, come Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts to us be blessed. Meaning, if you come, awesome. And if you don't, thanks for the food. <laughs> <laughs> like, what what better prayer is there to to handle both left and right kingdom simultaneously? Yeah. We want you to come back, but if you don't, we're, well, but actually, like in the Exodus, right? Eat standing up, have your staff and everything ready to go, but don't not eat. Like, still eat, make your unleavened bread, and just be ready. That's all that that, that prayer uh, summarizes is when you pray, come Lord Jesus, you're just saying, listen, we're ready, but we're going to eat because you gave this to us to eat. Right. But then there's like the feeding miracle, right? 5,000 mm -hmm. in particular. It's like, mm -hmm. I preached on this before. It's like, how do they end up out in the middle of nowhere with Jesus mm -hmm. and no food? Right? Well, they were I probably mean, destitute to begin with. That's why they followed him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it says it's three days journey, I think, which is, mm -hmm. that's a reference to something. Yeah, could be. By the way, right. I thought yeah. of another thing that we might want to read at some point is, because uh, we talked about, I think in the last episode, um, um, the poet Goethe. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't realize how like spiritual he is. Mm -hmm. And I saw a quote, and I, I should have written it down or right, saved, copy pasted it or wherever right. it was, where he talked about how he basically said that all of life uh, that life requires uh, daily dying and rising. Mm -hmm. I was like, whoa, that's from Goethe, huh? Yeah. So pick that up from his uh, Lutheran catechism. Was catechized. Apparently. Yeah. 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 Regardless of how he turned out. <laughs> Well, I know that's the thing. Did we ever read John Dunn's Holy Sonnets? No, you referred to it a lot at the beginning of the show. Yeah, because you like number whatever it is six Kepler. and eleven. Yeah. <laughs> As I've heard, uh, that'd be fun too. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Dun I don't know Dunn's background. Mm -hmm. Metaphysical Church poet, English Church of guy. England, Church of England. Yep. Okay. Yep. But yeah, same thing. He, we haven't done any. Have we done poetry at all? Have we read no, poetry? No, that's what I was thinking about that. I, I mean, about Faust would be to fun to read. Books, too, like, like the Runaway Bunny, I'm like, that's literally a parable of the Heavenly Father's love that he chases after mm -hmm. you and brings you back home. Same thing with where the wild things are, where you're like... Because when Max gets home, his dinner's waiting for him. There's quite a bit in the, uh, in the adventures of, uh, you know, Pooh and whatnot. Yeah, absolutely. He's got, there's a lot of references there. Obviously, Dude, Charlie Brown, we've talked about before. right. right. <laughs> We, yeah, we could do poetry for sure. Isn't it something like, I wonder if that's just not a reflection of, uh, of uh, you know, Flannery O'Connor's statement about being Christ haunted, mm. that we just can't help but right. tell these yeah. stories of redemption, and redemption right. comes by another, mm -hmm. you know, outside of ourself. And, yeah. And just can't, that, that story has to be told. <laughs> it mm -hmm. keeps finding its way out one way or we another. We also haven't read Flannery O'Connor on the show. We Didn't we? Yeah, we did. We did a, we did did a we? short story. We did two episodes. It was towards the beginning. Hmm. So it would have been like three or four years ago. Was what did we read? It's the Revelation, one. Revelation, Good Country People. I think it was Good Country People. Yeah. Okay. Was it, or was it for that? Was that for our previous podcast? Uh, but you was the previous podcast. You the think previous so? Previous incarnation of this podcast. Yeah. We didn't do it on here, huh? All right. Well, I'll take your word for it. I thought we did it here. <laughs> We're both episodes. trying to find. <coughs> she's 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 been banned oh look at that <laughs> yes she has i guess i guess it wasn't yeah all right huh because we could read that too because the point of good country people and one of, it's one of my favorite sort of stories ever is because you have this young woman named holga remember with the wooden leg yeah right yeah i know and we her, read through it oh. Her, oh no we did for sure because her mom and her friend from down the road gossiping about each other and the bible salesman and it's a fantastic story it's so yeah. good yeah and with summer coming up maybe that's what we need to focus on is uh literature instead of go diving into the atheist like nietzsche and back and yeah until the heavy philosophy yeah that'd be something worth doing again somebody wrote listening. an article on hosea and flannery o'connor i wonder who that was I I that, right i thought i figured you wrote it it's either me or Chad, right? Uh, da, 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 excerpt. Yeah, it was Chad. <laughs> Good call. Uh, yeah. You wrote one on uh, Lord Help My Lack of Love, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that you really reference her. I guess it yeah. wasn't for 1517 that we read that book. Oh, well. Well, I guess we're going to now. Oh, that, that sort of story. It's just chum in the water for me, so. 
Well, maybe yeah. we should pick something else since we, yeah, well, anyway. No, let's do it again because we're older, we're more seasoned. It'd be fun to revisit that as, as. It was a great story. On this. Well, there's that one. I mean, there's uh, A Good Man is Hard to Find with the Misfit. There's so many. I think we, we could... talked about doing that next after that. But... Uh, what's his face? The guy gets the tattoo on his back of Jesus. Yeah, there's so many. I highly recommend that, by the way. Anybody who's who likes short stories or is into really good fiction, Flannery O'Connor's complete short stories is second to none. Right. It really is fantastic. I think I picked it up on Kindle. And I was reading mm -hmm. through it there. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, good. Now we have our next topic. Flannery O'Connor, who the Roman Catholic Church won't claim and Lutherans love, but a lot won't admit it because she's way more Lutheran than Catholic <laughs> in her writing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and there is that other thing that we're Yankees, right? That too. But she had lupus. She died very young. She was bedridden most of her life. She liked peahens. She thought that they were a reflection of her personality, <laughs> which is fantastic. Um, she was devout, though. She went to Mass religiously. Mm -hmm. But she just wasn't, because I've got her letters and her papers, and she just, she wasn't down with the papacy. She, that was just a part of it. But like you said, her whole thing about, like, the South isn't Christ-centered, it's Christ-haunted. And I think, you know, and, and to say way back into Haman here to wrap this up, too, I think that's what Haman discovers when he gets to London is he comes out of Germany yeah. and discovers, I'm not Christ-centered, I'm Christ-haunted. Like I have all of the trappings of Christianity, but I don't have any faith. Well, I was my wife when we were dating. Doesn't that describe the Enlightenment as a whole? Yeah, 100%. You know, it's, it's definitely, um, well, the, it's actually trying to impose the law back upon the church in, right. in a kind of authoritarian way. Well, think about moralistic therapeutic deism in relation to Haman, right? That being a good person, moralistic, being a good person can only take you so far. Therapy, therapeutic language. You're a good person. God loves you just the way you are. He wants you to be happy. That can only take you so far. Deism, believing in God, can only take you so far. And when Haman goes through these things that he's going through in London, whether you're a good man or not, you're still destitute. You're still suffering. Mm -hmm. And same thing. I don't like myself. And I'm wondering what's wrong with me that I'm not succeeding in life, that I'm lost, that I have these questions that no one seems to be able to answer. And yes, I believe in God, but it doesn't seem to be enough for me. There's something missing. And mm -hmm. like he says, then your soul is formless and void. That's what's missing is the Holy Spirit. Right. And so maybe 80% of the time, 75% of the time, being a moralistic therapeutic deist can get you through the day. Because like we talked about, you're just really trying to justify your guilt and your shame. You're right. just trying to pr prove you're righteous before God and your neighbor. But when that isn't working, when you're an addict, again, for example, and people look at you and like, ugh, look at, look at him. I mean, how did he get here? Well, obviously he's immoral. He's made terrible decisions. He's a criminal, obviously. And therefore, God couldn't possibly be happy with the way that this person's life turned out. Right, right. And God has obviously abandoned this person. Well, now what do you do? Is he outside of the grace of God? Well, in moralistic therapeutic deism, yeah. Or you take him on as a rehabilitation project so that he can stand before the church then on the day of his, his sobriety birthday and say, because of this church and because of the grace of God, I stand before you a sober Christian man. I have reformed my life. I have a good job. I have a wife and children. I have a house that I can call my own. And yet three years ago, I was living on the street on Skid Row. Now, that's a fantastic story, and I'm not going to knock that story. That's good. However, Jesus is missing. The gospel is missing. The sacraments are missing. Reorientation, as Haman puts it, is missing. So how long is that going to carry him before he falls off the wagon or he struggles with his sobriety or just in general, he has questions? Now what? Right. And like right. I said, that can carry you a long way. Well, I've been, I've been struck by this because we've been reading through Ecclesiastes this week. Um, and I just, it's almost unintelligible. And I think mm -hmm. it's for this point is that it's operating, Solomon's operating from a different yeah. you know, perspective, framework, mm -hmm. worldview than we yeah. do. Right. And that, I mean, obviously it's that, 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 uh, re repeated, repeated phrase, right? All is vanity. Right. You know, it's like grasping for the wind. Mm -hmm. Um, and we, we just don't think that way about our lives as being, you know, so much that we put our fear, love and trust in is just being well, He's also the empty. king. And he wanders the streets of Jerusalem preaching because that's, that's what Kohelet means. It means preacher. Right, 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 right. So you have the king and people, 
I don't think appreciate this. And I bring this out once it was revealed to me is you make fun of Nebuchadnezzar for losing his mind. Oh yeah. And, and then being a wild beast for yeah. however many years it was. Yeah. But Solomon, whose king wanders the streets of Jerusalem preaching the words that become Ecclesiastes, like he's the king. He's the most powerful man that they know. And he's saying, yeah, it's all worthless. It's like right, I said before. Right, go ahead. No, and I, you know, it's some of this stuff is really hard to hear. Yeah. I'll use your favorite translation because <laughs> mm -hmm. otherwise it's like, what is he even talking about? Right. But like the one who loves money is never satisfied with money, nor the yeah. one who loves wealth with big profits, more smoke, right. more loot you get, the more looters show up. What fun <laughs> is that to be robbed in broad daylight? <laughs> You mean like right. what's happening to us right now? Yeah, exactly. Well, and it comes right <laughs> after a thing about, about you know, the authorities just, you know, yeah. exploiting from one one to the next. That's what the right. world looks like. Yeah. But then he, but he does this chapter five. So you have to get like five chapters in before he says anything really all that encouraging. Mm -hmm. But but to this point, which you were talking about, you know, of this contentedness of being, you know, just resting in the, in the word of God and the peace mm -hmm. that he gives. This is after looking at the way things are on this earth, here's what I've decided is the best way to live. Take care of yourself, have a good time, and make the most of whatever job you have as long as God gives you life. That's about yeah. it. <laughs> That's the human lot. Yes, we yeah. should make the most of what God gives, both the bounty and the capacity to enjoy it, accepting mm -hmm. what's given and delighting in the work. It's God's gift. I mean, it almost mm -hmm. sounds like um, that that uh, uh, Latin proverb, right? Uh, seize the day. Well, it sounds like stoicism. Mm -hmm, it does, yeah. Which makes me wonder which came first, Solomon or Stoics? Mm -hmm. uh -huh, uh -huh, right. Yeah. Uh, accepting what's given and delighting in the work—it's God's gift. God deals out joy in the present, the now. It's useless to brood over how long we might live. Right. Right. That's vanity. Is to like say I'm going to plan, like especially now with uh, rapid right. inflation, right? Like, right. how can I set up a hedge against inflation? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> nobody has any idea. No, nobody has any clue. I mean, maybe commodities, mm -hmm. but, like but even I said, then, uh, I read last night MIT had to adjust their decline of their implosion of civilization estimation. Oh, really? And MIT had said it was 2040, and then they updated it to 2025 to 2030. <laughs> Just got ten years Thanks, right guys. off. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> right. But well, so what models. happens? Yeah. Well, and, but here's, I mean, here's the thing with collapse of civilization. I want to look on the bright side of life here, yeah. right? As I'm hanging on the cross. So <laughs> <laughs> always look on the bright side of life. Right. Uh, to say, well, how much of what we consider society do we really want to retain? Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, I love all the first world things. I have a water well, as heater. As a Christian, again. California can just slide into the ocean. That will just. Not again. the not the people we love there, though. Well, they can get they can get on the ark. Oh, get on the ark or run off. Before but the runoff takes something into the This is the ocean. problem with God's wrath, is we always pray for God to come as long as he just leaves us alone. We're the good <laughs> yeah. ones. We're the good ones. <laughs> like like the Leslie Nielsen meme, right? Yeah. <laughs> Where he's standing, everything's on fire around yeah. him. Nothing to see here. Yeah, Nothing to see along. here. That's what. That's the life we want to live. <laughs> <clears throat> but as the testimony of Jeremiah bears out, we're going with him. Yeah. Just, right. you know, as I said, God sends us to preach, but he doesn't promise that we're going to be heard. Right, and but I was why, yeah. yeah, when I was reading the Ecclesiastes thing, I was thinking about what you were saying earlier about preaching in the present tense. Yeah. Is that that's ultimately his his conclusion. Yeah. Is like, I look past, I see nothing that I really want mm -hmm. to retain. I look forward, I can't know what that is anyway. Right, right. And plus he's an old man and, you know, mm -hmm. he knows his, his days are being coming to an end anyway. Right. I was like, all I can do is live live now with what God sets before me. Right. Right, and that, so I mean, that's always the 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 problem with all like the the stuff we like to post in our Telegram group, right? Mm -hmm. As we look forward and like, yeah, all these terrible things could happen, or maybe not. Mm -hmm. It's like you can try to be prepared. There's nothing wrong with preparedness, right? But on the other hand, the prepare, you're, there's no promise your preparedness is going to be enough, right? Or or it could be that it was a complete waste of your time. Right, as it's well. a futile and useless gesture. Mm -hmm. Vanity, yeah. like grasping for the wind, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, the the upside is no one listened to Solomon, <laughs> and no one listens to us. Well, it got so, recorded at least, right? Exactly. And as, but how as many people have read Ecclesiastes? It's I mean it's rough. It's hard to get through. I get that. It is, for sure. But it goes to the point though is that again read Luther's commentary on Ecclesiastes. He actually sees that as a like here's a theologian of the cross preaching the truth. Yeah, and, and in that way it's comforting then. And in that way it is comforting because. Our hope is not in the future. Our hope is in the present tense work of the Holy Spirit, which is a sign to us that, come what may, we're good. 
which you're mm -hmm. going to preach on James on Sunday, right? Oh, I'm going to move away and, and work for a year and make my fortune, and then I'll come back and, and things will be yeah, awesome. Right, again. right. And he's like, you fool. <laughs> like, did, God didn't promise you tomorrow. He gave you to the day. He's quoting from David. Mm -hmm. And likewise, I'm given today. That's it. So live for today. Well, and he also, what I like about it is it's kind of like, uh, you know, Cormac McCarthy or something. He's just yeah. brutally honest about things. Yeah. It's like, yeah, when you see like the oppression of the poor and the perversion mm -hmm. of justice, violent perversion of justice yeah. and righteousness, you know, in your country, why are you, don't marvel. Why are you right. surprised? This is, this right. is the way things have been in our uh, first sinful people mm -hmm. in this world. It's like, you know, it, I don't want to be fatalistic, right. but on the other hand, you have to be realistic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, you can pray against these things. You can pray that mm -hmm. God amend them, but if he right. doesn't, what's that to you? Okay, it he's, might make your life yeah. a little bit more difficult. Okay. Well, as I said before we hit record, though, he's still going to send Joshua's. He's still going to send David's. Mm -hmm. Things still need to be done according to God's will, and they will. For the sake of faith, right? Mm -hmm. For the sake of faith, for the, to keep his promise. And to as gather he says, all I will those annihilate, who will believe. Yeah, yeah. I will annihilate everyone and everything that stands in the way of my promise being delivered to you. Mm. Which, again, is either the most comforting thing that you could possibly hear, or you might want to check yourself and make sure you're not one of those things that are in his way. Yeah, it sounds a little violent, actually. Right? I know. Mm -hmm. How dare he? Mm -hmm. Be wild. <laughs> and so I think what prayer, what Haman's driving at with prayer is, it is comforting because the Holy Spirit's at work, and you recognize, according to Scripture, the Holy Spirit's at work because we can't pray, we don't know how to pray. But simultaneously, it will crush you because the revelation that you don't know how to pray and so the Holy Spirit is praying for you is, hey, amen, praise be to Christ. Simultaneously, wait a minute. I can't pray? Well, you right. can pray. You just don't know God's name and therefore he can't hear you. Well, where do I get God's name? In baptism when he attaches it to your name. Right. And then there's that section about like how, I mean, the Spirit shines a light in the darkness. Yes. And that's, that's the thing that's most awkward, I think, about prayer. Sure. Is that is that, um, you know, faithful or honest or truthful mm -hmm. prayer, as we talked about with preaching, it's the same with prayer. Yeah. It reveals things that we'd rather not talk about or acknowledge. I'm, I talked about this with civil action. You know, uh, the, the collects that were given by our church body to pray for, is to pray for justice, or not justice, for, for peace and tranquility, right? Right. As like, and then I go back and I read prayers from even like 20, 30 yeah. years ago. And it was like, no, we're praying against tyranny. We're praying mm -hmm. against totalitarian, you know, yeah. we're, we're praying, we prayed against the communists. I mean, we, mm -hmm. we weren't afraid to, to, you know, acknowledge the darkness, yeah. that which is opposed to Christ and his word. Right. Um, you know, especially state-based religions that are, mm -hmm. you know, they, they don't call them religions. They call them movements, but they're religions. They're religions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we prayed against them and now we don't. And it seems like. And they've that overtaken it, us. Right, because we were dishonest, and yes. we were, uh, and we remained in ignorance, and we left our. I think as you know, churches and, and maybe the pastors of the churches. Mm -hmm. It's hard. I don't want to accuse my elders of things. Uh, it just it seems like you know we let our guard down, right, as a mm -hmm. church, um, and maybe I'm culpable in that too, because well, we didn't call a thing what it was. Do, the sheep only go where the shepherd leads. Yeah, well, that's that's well, that's true. And if the pastor leaves the barn door open, the wolves are going to get in. Right. I don't I mean, know. You always I, have to pray against people by name, you know. I mean, I want to. I want to pray against the evil Bill Gates, and just say that in church. But um, yeah, but it, it, the names may change, but the characters are the same. Right. That's the point, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's like a mask. Again, I posted that cartoon from 1948, and everyone's like, "Oh yeah, that's today." It's like exactly. It's again, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Luther refers to to um, those working within vocation as as God's mask. Yeah. Does he, does he also refer to others wearing Satan's mask? I wonder. Yes, he does in the large catechism under uh, Lead Us Not Into Temptation. So, so it'd be larvae. He calls like them allies, or something. Well, oh, allies. Allies. Yeah, Satan's allies in the world. Well, and yeah, he that's names a... them, but he names them the rulers of this world. Right, right. Are Satan's allies. He, he, like, he, doesn't, like, he doesn't equivocate like some are godly and some are... He'd be like, the rulers of this world are Satan's allies. Right. And you think about how uncomfortable folks are with us calling things demonic. Right. I've, I've been struck by that. And, yeah. But I've been doing it since COVID, basically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because it's like, look, if you're undermining um, the free assembly you know, of Christians around yeah. Jesus and his word, then yeah. that's demonic. It's demonic. against God's exactly. word. It's against his word. 
And I don't care. I'm not saying that the person is a demon. Um, that's possible, but I mean, they're flesh and blood, so they're probably, so they're possessed. Right. <laughs> right. And we can, right. we can, can we exercise the demons that are around yes. us? Well, Jesus did, and he gives us authority, all the authority mm -hmm. that he has. Correct. With his word. Mm -hmm. So why aren't we exercising demons? Right. You know, praying against them, praying over them. Hmm. Well, because we don't believe they're real anymore. Yeah. We call them lizard people. Isn't that a, another way of saying the that though? Vril. Yeah. That's all they are. Yeah. <laughs> It's just saying it's again it's like the the pentagon and stuff like there's ufos they're real it's like or yeah or i would note again nikolai tesla's patent for his flying machine project blue beam yes is the you. exact design of your flying saucers but you can go back to da vinci and all of you this can go stuff back to da vinci too. exactly who tesla probably got it from actually same design again there's nothing new under the sun to quote our friend the preacher it's only the technology catches up exactly so again what is in the imagination of man all the days of his life well according to the word of god evil period right and by evil we mean not that god. which that which would take us away from faith exactly yeah, christ. specifically yeah. yeah not just not god but antichrist whatever is right. not christ is is evil and so we're constantly doing this, whether it be, like you noted, conspiracies, like, well, it's this, that, or the other thing, versus, as our friend Paulson said on the ringside with the preachers a couple of years ago, the real conspiracy is Satan is the prince of this world and nobody believes it. And he's conspiring against you. Like, that right. is the ultimate conspiracy, and even Christians deny it. Right. And yet, that's being done, or that's being done under God's authority yes. for our benefit. Right. <laughs> I know. Right. Which is even harder to get your head around, I suppose. Right. Well, yeah. then this comes back to the whole point of prayer then is Luther in his Genesis lectures points out that the church in prayer is a wall that holds back God's wrath. Mm. So when the church stops praying, God's wrath pours out onto sinful creation and there annihilates it. Yeah, that ties that ties it up pretty well. And therefore, when we recognize this is God's wrath, like God has taken his word away from us. Mm. Yeah, that's when you pray more. That's when you double, triple, quadruple down because the very fact that you are praying basically motivated to pray is a sign the Holy Spirit's at work pushing you. Yeah, it's true. I mean, the word is described as a bulwark and a shield, right? Right. Yeah. And it doesn't, again, it doesn't have to be long, windy prayers. It doesn't have to be well thought out. You don't perfect. have to name things by, you, you, perfect, right. Practically perfect in every way. But rather you recognize this is evil. This, whatever you're describing, this event, this person, this group, this movement, it's evil. So we're going to pray against this evil, like conflict and disunity in our society or in our communities, right, right, right? right? You don't have to name leaders. You don't have to name the movement. Just that's a sign. Like if your city is on fire, that's a clear sign that there's disunity and a lack of concord. There's conflict and strife to quote the litany. So, so I mentioned that Leslie Mills, Nielsen meme, but I mean, isn't that how we often pray? Uh -huh. The well, world's well, going to hell around us. It was the Waukesha meme, right? Yeah. This, it's a mostly peaceful protest while the city's on fire behind them. It's like, that's literally the meme. Right, but yeah. that's our prayer. Yeah. It's like we we're we're ignoring the reality that's around us, and and right. what? But I would say, what was the spirit have us do? Right. Is actually to address the thing that we're actually most terrified of, right? Well, and that's what I'll bring up the litany since it's our go-to, I think, for mm -hmm. both of us. Which is that the beauty of the litany is it forces me to pray for people I don't like and for people that I wish death upon. Well, and then weapons. things that you'd rather not believe are true. Yeah. That too, but specifically mm -hmm. when you're praying for our political leaders, mm -hmm. right? Is like sometimes it's fun because you're like that's our guy. He's on our team. And then the rest of the time you're like, I'm not praying for that guy because he's not on our team and he's evil and he's ruining everything. It's like, I don't, my entire pastoral ministry, I've never been comfortable praying for any of them by name. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe I'm a little bit, uh, you know, too libertarian, but anarchistic. Well, no, it's actually that I've never quite believed that they were all legitimately elected. Right. That too. But that's the point is the, the beauty of the litany in our Lutheran service book is that it, it takes, our thoughts and feelings, mm. tosses them in the dumpster fire of history and says, pray this way. <laughs> and yeah. we do. We pray against yeah. ourselves. We pray for our enemies. We pray for those things that we don't even think about. Yeah. And again, and the litany is great because it's also on, uh, for what reason, or on behalf, uh, not on behalf of, but uh, on the basis of, right? Right. It's like, you know, your crucifixion, your suffering, your death, right? right? I mean, yeah. it's very focused. You're essentially, yeah, it runs through the Ten Commandments. It runs through the whole history of salvation. It runs through your vocation in ways that you can't possibly even imagine. Then you read it like, wow, this is beautiful. <laughs> it's so short and brief and terse and yet so comprehensive simultaneously. Right, right. 
And it's, I, I just find it useful in that sense of one, to be able to pray briefly, but specifically, and, and formally, by the way, that's, I mean, you have the litany I introduced to my confirmand, Sunday school, my kids, church, everywhere. I'm like, if you have trouble praying, here, in, in, you, apparently you didn't open to the Psalms, pray the litany. It's beautiful. It's short. It's terse. Or just pray, Lord have mercy, in the name of Jesus, amen, <laughs> and go to bed. That's that works enough. too. That's more that than works enough. too. It's more than enough. Yeah, and the Spirit will intercede. He'll be exactly, good. exactly. And I think that's the that's the heart of all this is that in the end, the the Spirit is our advocate, as Jesus is our advocate, and that is their primary vocation within the Godhead is to advocate for us to say, yeah, they can't, and so we have to do it for them, and they well, do. Think, didn't Haman? I mean, he said as much that that we pray uh, in in faith, but also for the sake of faith. Hundred percent. Right, so that that's the other aspect here. Yeah, it's not just the words. Lord, that, I believe. Right, but the reason for prayer is that, is that orientation uh, towards yeah. God and fear, love, and trust. Right? right, that He would care for you, and so you make your intercessions known. That's you the cannot. symbol, right? Mm -hmm. The symbol is I believe, but I really don't. <laughs> all right, that's all I got. I mean, that's. <laughs> That's the beauty of it, and, and that's the comfort of, of... I was trying to find a downloadable version of the of the thing. I'm going to actually link to a site I normally wouldn't, but they've got a downloadable, <laughs> a printable a version, version of, the litany. of the litany. So that, cool. yeah, even if you're not, you know, you don't have mm -hmm. a hymnal or whatnot, you can use... They've got a printable version here that cool. you can use. So I'll link that up. I love it. So we'll wrap it up there a little early this week, but that's good. It's good. Das ist gut. Uh, as always, thank you for listening to the podcast. Thank you for your encouragement and your emails and DMs. Thanks for visiting our congregations when you're in the area. Yeah, I, I appreciate that's great. it. And I know you do too. Yeah, you are a gift to us when you do that, and, and I love it. It's fantastic. I'm glad that in all of our incoherent ramblings and side paths that you actually benefit from this. Although uh, you know who you are, and your wife had no idea what we were talking about. <laughs> it's fantastic which is exactly the way it should be. You listen to our podcast and your wife is blissfully naive to everything that we're talking about so she can keep you on an even keel. It's perfect. But uh, thank you to Alan and everybody else and um, come back next week for a brand new episode. Peace. Just, yeah, you usually say peace at the end. That's what I, I thought. Did. I was holding on. Oh, okay. I was holding out. I'll fade out. All right. Yeah, there's a litany. So you're going to a, you're gonna have to do a little cutting anyways. Of what? Clear away my my throat at the beginning of the episode. Oh, yeah. No, I always listen through the whole thing again. There we go. For better, for worse. Yes, exactly. For rich oh. or poor, for sickness and health. That's kind of the relationship I feel like I have with the show. Yeah. <laughs> it's a marriage. <laughs> it's like Tom Segura said. He's like, you ever be talking to a person and feel like they poisoned you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's often yes <laughs> listening to myself i feel that way quite often actually you're welcome melody thank you uh, it's all a gift it's all a gift uh speaking of inflation hedge uh, i'm gonna meet with the i got a contractor in the congregation now that's i didn't realize how handy that would be yes it is <laughs> it's very i mean cause, handy. well because i have like four different plumbers that i've used since i've mm -hmm. lived here in the four years you know, and they're they're all wildly inconsistent, and you know, yeah, it's like you can't, and you, some they won't do the job, and da, 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 da. yeah, right. I'm like, hmm, what do I actually need? I need somebody who just says, do this, yeah, right, <laughs> and tells the plumber to do it, right? Yep. I can't be the contractor that, that's calling every day. When are you going to get to the job? When are you going to get to the job? Yep. So I'm meeting with them today. We're gonna put what money we have into the house because we might as well. Because cool. yeah. what good is it in cash? I don't know. It's not going to be worth not. anything. No, so no, might as well. In, you know, it was the first house we owned, and we did all the updates right before mm. we moved. And we were like, that mm. was the dumbest thing ever. Sure. Like, the bathroom was actually nice. We had a, when we moved in, and the whole time we lived there, we had a carpeted bathroom. You ever had a carpeted bathroom with children? Uh, no. <laughs> because the other night, my daughter, we have two rugs, right? And right. my four-year-old didn't quite make it to the toilet. Yeah, washable. Right, washable. You yeah, throw them in the wash. Exactly. But not when they're permanently attached to the floor, right? No. Ugh. And it was plush, too. It was like two inch. Oh. Oh, the, the 70s, right? Oh, totally. Yeah. So then we finally, you know, I ripped it out and I put in, I don't remember what kind of floor, tile or something. And uh, and, then we, and then we sold it. I was like, we did it to sell the house. I'm like, that was right. stupid. That that was the best kitchen ever because mm. 
Uh, one end of the kitchen were, were mirrored glass doors mm-hmm. to the because the laundry was in the kitchen. It was a little house. And then all around the soffit were mirrors hmm. above you. Yeah. So totally 70s, right? Yeah. But you kind of felt like you were in a disco or yeah. something like that, right? 100%. But you, like, you could look up and see what you were doing with your hands on the counter. I, I'm trying to figure out like what the logic was or the thought process. Cocaine and quaaludes. Don't try and think about it. It's just <laughs> cocaine and quaaludes. Well, maybe with all the mirrors, they're just trying to make it feel bigger in there than it really was. I don't know. It's I'm not sure. It's a confusing. I mean, they invented the waterbed. Say no more at that point. I had a waterbed. I loved so did it. I. Nope. Until it until it ruptured. Exactly. Which, My girlfriend I mean, in high school had a waveless waterbed. It was like tubes full of water. Oh yeah, yeah, it had the the like the ribbing in it to keep it. Yeah, from... but her heater broke, so her bed was always freezing cold. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wonder. Did I have a heater in mine? I can't remember. But I just didn't see the point because it was waveless. I'm like, why don't you just own a mattress then? Yeah, what's where's the fun in that? But her parents own a furniture store, so that's how that <laughs> happened. <laughs> This, this is a bizarre wow. conversation. Yeah. Anyways. Anyway, I'm supposed to meet with the contractor. That was my point. <laughs> yeah. No, they're the best. My uh, One of my trustees is a contractor. He came with a bobcat, and they redid the entire uh, flower uh, beds around the church. Oh, yeah, right, right. Three right, hours right. just to rip them and No, done. but what I found is that these tradespeople, I don't know what right. it is, right? It's been this way for since COVID, basically, mm-hmm. is that they're just like extraordinarily busy. It's hard to get them to commit yeah. to doing anything. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I mean, it's gotta be nice to have more work than you right. have time for. Right. But on the other hand, it's like, this is no, we can't go forward this way. Right. Like we need to have people that are available to us. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I guess there's that great resignation as they called it, right? All these people quitting. Yeah. And just no, not working. Hear the economy is booming and more people are working now than ever. My governor just made that statement last night. Oh, I was, was going to say, who was that? Appropriate response from a majority of people. I was going to say, Peppermint Patty, she's she's off at MSNBC now. Yeah, exactly. So it wasn't her who said it. No. Do you see the, you see the scandal with the new uh, press secretary? Yeah, I saw her. yeah. No, that she was wearing a dress from Ivanka. Yeah, she's a <laughs> from her clothing line. <laughs> oh, she's, she is, she's a winner, let me tell you. She must be a joy at parties because. Man, she's a happy-go-lucky free spirit. Let me tell you about all the ways you're privileged and I'm not. Right. That's Standing yeah. there, getting paid more than I'll ever see in my lifetime to not right. talk to people. And to not answer questions. Not answer questions. and Just excuse everyone of racism or sexism or some ism. Uh, yeah, genderism. A, uh, everything. No, that's sexism. Uh, oh, the sexual identity-ism? I don't even know mm-hmm. what that's called. It doesn't matter anymore. It's oh, all a shell game. All... We've only got, what, 10 days until we get to kick off the month again. There we go. And be assaulted by the message for a month. For a month. But only here. Not in other countries. We can't, Did you, we can't. Uh, I should post a link to this. Um, the Victor Orban speech from CPAC in, in mm-hmm. uh, where's Victor Orban, uh, Prime Minister? Um, Hungary? Is that right? No. Mm, okay. <coughs> no, Turkey, right? No. I'll do it. You're the worst producer ever. <sighs> Victor Orban. He has Hungarian like a, politician. Yeah, Hungary, right. Prime Minister Which is, of Hungary since 2010. This is, the, this is the guy that did kind of like the Putin thing without all the Putin war invasion stuff, mm-hmm. where he's like, you know what? We're going to promote families and having children, and right. you know, we're not going to be into all the, the weird... Right. He's like, we 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 uh, we just banned all the LGBTQ stuff before it even happened here. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, that was helpful. Do you see what Russian, uh, Russian media is reporting that the, financial, the worldwide financial collapse is going to happen by the end of the year? Well, if they have anything to say about it. That's what I'm saying. It's like, again, listen to your enemy. That's all I'm saying. Listen to your enemy. Uh, well, a lot of times I mean, they're, they're going to tell you more truth than your uh, supposed allies are going to tell you. So so obviously food production, uh, mm-hmm. Russia's self dependent they, they can export more than they have. They don't have to import right. it at all. Right. That Putin did that over the last 10 years or so. Mm-hmm. Now we're talking Putin. We're going to get banned or whatever. But I know. But what was the stat I saw? 65% of the world's grain reserves are in China. Yeah. So between the two of them, they pretty much got it locked up. Yeah. So again, if state media says that this is it, well, it's propaganda, but it's but that doesn't it mean is. it's not true. <laughs> again, I was yeah, propaganda can be true, folks. I hate to break it to you, but it can be true. So start your gardens, start mm-hmm. canning. We've been drying, canning, get, yeah. flash freezing, yeah, yeah, doing all that stuff. I was reading a statistic. Last week, it was a very interesting short little essay that in during the Depression, all the way through World War II, most rural families 
eighty percent of their food came right out of their backyards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. that long ago. Yeah, it wasn't. And that, and to the point about World War II and the processed foods and perfecting the whole, you know, factory production of food, it was literally like two generations. Because by the sixties, they forgot. People had forgotten. Well, and we lost. I think we lost our taste for things. What was the thing I was um, mm -hmm. reading about? Oh, uh, bean curds. Mm -hmm. That we don't do bean curd, but you can take like just yeah. a little bit of dried dried beans or yeah. seeds, and and then sprout them. Yeah, uh, you know, for a week or whatever, right. and then dry it out, and uh, mm -hmm. or not dry it out, just grind it up, and mm -hmm. you end up with like, like it's like a hundred times the nutric that you yeah. started with from just the dried beans. Right. right. You can do that in the winter. Yeah. You know, end up with basically organic. You know, fresh food. Right. But we've like, who even knows how to do that? Right. Exactly. Yeah, and then we don't even have a taste for it, right? Like, right. I don't know if I've ever had bean curd. I don't even know what it tastes like. Mm -mm. It sounds remember. gross, actually, but, I, you know, just being honest, curd. Well, I like curds. Well, because you ferment it as well. Right. Mm. Right. Well, we eat a lot of fermented things, though, so. Yeah, me too. I think you have to, well, it's like with kombucha and other things. You just have to mm -hmm. develop a taste for it because when you first drink it, you're like, ugh, why does anybody do this? But. Now, I've noticed yeah. the kombuchas have gotten a lot less sour and a lot more sweet. Mm-hmm. You know, the commercial ones? Yes. Mm. No, we've been noticing that a lot of brands that we have been buying because they were, you know, free of quote unquote natural flavors, now have natural flavors in them. <laughs> natural flavors. Right. I like that term, natural flavors. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's a constant, I don't want to say, it's a constant, uh, not struggle, but... It's just, again, it's discipline that you have to pay attention to what's coming and, and what, you're, what you're consuming, basically. But I like this idea of like actually now, while you have the opportunity to learn to eat like, you mm -hmm. know, kimchi, sauerkraut, yeah. you know, just acquire the taste for it. Just start right. small, use it right. on the side or something. And well, for us, for example, like my, my 11 year old uh, baked brownies last night by himself. Mm, okay. Right. It's part of his, his uh, school, uh, what's it called food sciences or whatever. And they're really good. Like, they're so good. Like, they turn mm. out great. Like, he's got a talent for it. My daughter, my older daughter, Alma, when she makes stuff, we all make up excuses to not be in the house when it comes out. Because <laughs> it's, it's just like, I thought it would be interesting to combine these ingredients. And we're like, I got a thing over here I got to go do for a while. And then the dogs usually end up eating it or it goes in the garbage. But the same thing, my, my nine-year-old, um, like, he figured out how to make popcorn. He want, but he, But the thing is... What's interesting about the nine and 11 year old then, or 10 and 11 year old, about to be 12, is they want to learn how to do this stuff so that they can feed the family. Like they feel like they're contributing now to the family because they are, right? Oh like, yeah, I wanna, right. I want to make food for the family because they see mom and dad and the older kids making stuff. And they're like, we want to do that. But also then of course, they're learning how to provide for themselves. And hmm. we teach them that like, you don't appreciate this now, but as you learn to bake, like not just brownies, but breads and other things. As you get older, then you're going to learn how to grow wheat or mill your own wheat with an electric mill and make flour. Like these right. are all things you can do. They're within your grasp if you want to do them. But then when they explain this to their friends, <laughs> their friends are just baffled. Like, why don't you just buy brownies? Like they make them for you at the store. They come in, in handy, even single service plastic yeah. wrap. Yeah. yeah. And my kids tell them the same thing. They're like, they taste terrible. They taste like plastic. Oh, they have that residue on your palate? Like, what yeah. is that? Ugh. Vinyl. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Whatever it is. Natural yeah, flavors. Well, we've done the same thing. I mean, some of this is the benefit of homeschool, too. Um, right. You know, because <laughs> it's funny. We had a long rant at a council meeting last night about uh, we want to start a hot lunch program because the food we're getting from the local school district mm -hmm. bring right. into the school here has just right. been terrible. Like, they have, a thing, they have a thing where the main course is just mozzarella cheese stick, but they call it pizza dippers to try to make it sound like a main course. Like you, you can't just give breaded fried <laughs> cheese sticks to kids and say that that's a meal. Yeah, I mean you can. That's but... an hors d'oeuvre at a Applebee's. Like no, that doesn't work. Right, right. It was part of the two for twenty. Yeah. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Sad that you knew that. <laughs> it's even sadder that I set you up for that. <laughs> uh, but uh, what was I saying about this? But then like at homeschool, like for us, it's just like we have ingredients and they have. Yeah. We've given them options. They come up with their own things if they right. want. And they make their own lunch and right. they eat well because they eat, they know yeah. they need to eat so that they're not going to be hungry later because there's not right. going to be snacks, you know? Right. 
-hmm. and they figure it out I, and that's usually true for breakfast although sometimes we'll make them you know breakfast right. or sometimes they'll make their own but mm -hmm. you know it's it's like home ec class that used to be a thing right yeah and why because people weren't at home mom wasn't home right yeah yeah or that's dad. why microwaves right. were essentially became popularized no, that was NASA, so we could go to space. Well, no, I'm saying popular in the sense like we weren't allowed to use the stove when we got home and our parents weren't there, so we... Oh, that's right. Up. Yeah, the latchkey thing. Yeah. <clears throat> Shit boy already. I had the best microwave brownies, speaking of brownies again. Mm -hmm. I, I, I got a blue ribbon in the uh, county fair for my Did microwave really? brownies. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> now you know. There we go. So you, you and your son, we're, we're, of, we're of a kind. <laughs> there we go. I actually Fantastic. did for like three years. I did microwave cooking in 4-H. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing Life what you can make in the microwave <laughs> right we don't have a microwave anymore yeah it's a good time so all right it's taco time <laughs> okay speaking of all right Ending thanks folks broadcast we'll see you bye-bye okay.